Testing one, two, three. This will be January 21st, 2015, City Council regular meeting. Good evening. Welcome to the regular City Council meeting with Satellite Beach, January 21st, 2015, approximately 7 p.m. Please join Councilman Gott in a moment of silence and the pledge. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. At this time, I'd open the floor for citizens' comments. This is on non-agenda items. Citizens first. Floor is open for non-agenda items. Okay. Ron Jagutis, resident Satellite Beach in the CRA. Last meeting, I talked about sea oats. And I had a comment thrown at me by council member. There are no free lunches. I think that's a disparaging comment from an elected official at a citizen. Additionally, as stated by me, the invoices for the COs have not been turned in yet. We are in a delay mode. We will be turning them in. And the paper can sit here. Residents along the beach pay taxes, just like everyone else. We have a CRA with a plan that was changed and nobody wanted to address the beachside issue. And the proposal for the sea oats is not on the immediate properties. It is to help in the right of way preserve what precious dollars were spent for the dune partial renourishment to assist in keeping that dune as long as it may. So the free lunch, there is a free lunch. When I hear there is a mobilization effort for the city at the parks to receive sea oats in reciprocation for giving up seats, and I wonder if that is even legal to do. And the city got it all on the city property that taxpayers pay for. Without taxpayers, there is no park. There is no beach for everyone to use and re use, utilize for recreation. And additionally, it has come to my attention now that where there has been dune washout, there are ATV tracks close to the edge. It doesn't make sense. I fought that battle two years ago, and it's starting again. And we had railroad vine out there growing that we residents didn't have sea oats for, and ATVs are riding right through it. And I don't appreciate such comments that it's a free lunch. Thank you. Thank you. Citizens' comments are still open. Hearing none further, bring it back to council. Okay. Non-agenda item. 
minutes. I refer back to the meeting that you folks held back in November on the resiliency. Okay. Okay. My name is Mark Abraham. And where you live? 220 North Marco Way. Okay. Thank you. There were many visuals used during that meeting, including three maps showing sea level rises in three different scenarios. I would like to ask that all of those visuals, including the three maps, be made publicly available, that they either be placed behind the front desk or that they be placed into the hall so that when people come to the town hall, they can see those and reference them. The other thing is, is that though I asked during the program for an explanation, I was told, oh, no, basically that's too controversial. We've moved on from that. And what it had to do with was what came up on a slide in which the slide said that this was all based on two things, sea level rise and global warming, both of which are very controversial issues, which are not established yet as being caused by man or even what the causes are. If you're going to base a program and come into our community and push an agenda, then you need to put forth the information that it's based on so that it's publicly available. In the case of global warming, I'd like to point out that I don't think anybody disagrees with the fact that there's global warming. What they disagree with is what causes it. There's a conflagration of terms in which we're confusing catastrophic anthropogenic, that's human caused global warming, versus the rise and fall of temperatures, which is known as global warming. It's a cycle just like the hydraulic cycle of water evaporating and falling back onto the earth again. Okay, it's a constant cycle. The other part of that is sea level rise. The average sea level rise, as per the scientists today, over the last hundred years is six to seven inches. Not one of those scenarios done was six to seven inches. You had three that eclipsed it by tenfold. And all of that is a scare tactic. And so I want the information that your program is based on. I want the science that it's based on. I want the scientists' names. I want the reports that you're using. Because before you come to us and try to push a resilient community, which, by the way, is an agenda. In other words, it's politically motivated. You guys were all elected to be able to represent all of us, not just those on the far left. And so I'm asking for that information to be made publicly available so that we can assess it and determine whether or not this is going in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. On your availability of all that information, it is available at City Hall at any time. Now, let me comment on the study that we're doing. It's the sea level portion, yes, it's controversy. That's only one of the issues that we're doing in this study. There's hurricanes that could hit us and so forth. So the resiliency study is not just based on global warming, sea level rise. It's how we prevent our community to be disrupted in an event. And what are those areas that are more prone to that type of action? And it is an ongoing study. We had it at the Ocean Reef Festival, and there's going to be a lot more public hearing. The agenda on this has not driven anything other than we are not the only community that is doing this. Most of the communities on the eastern seaboard of the United States are doing this. NASA is doing it. There's a lot of people have said if there is an issue, we need to look at it, and how do we make our community stronger? And that's where we're going with this study. And we got a grant to help us out on it. And the meeting is, I believe, is it February, Courtney? Do we have a date for the second? Not yet. Not yet. There will be another meeting on this. The, we have a site that you can go on, and we encourage you to go on it and fill it out. And what are your concerns? And uh, we spent a lot of time and effort to get feedback. And all this information is available 
at um, City Hall. It's on our, and it's on our website. It's on the website. I am, no, sir, no. Let me, now I'm going to ask one other thing to you. There's a gentleman I'm going to give you his name. His name is Steve Alexander. And Mr. Alexander lives in Vieira. He's a very interesting gentleman. I knew him for three years and didn't know what he did. He's one of the foremost authorities in the world on global warming. He's a gentleman that did most of the research on Antarctica. And he's a very interesting fellow. He really doesn't take sides. And I say this to you because it's very, very good information that the gentleman has. And I think it would be worthwhile for anybody that ever could come in contact with the man. Probably kill me for saying it to him, but he has done most of the study, especially the one that just came out on uh, the west slope of Antarctica melting so fast. He is one of the gentlemen that participated in it. He'd be a very interesting guy for you to get a hold of. Okay, thank you. Sir, sir, I, don't, I appreciate I'm just giving you the information. Okay, just throwing it out there so people can have the information. The floor is still open for public comment. Uh, Richard Charbonneau, uh, uh, Port Royal, DeSoto. Uh, you know, I can't remember all the addresses. Um, I'm going to follow up on that. I wasn't going to say anything, but the, uh, it, you know, it seems like anybody that disagrees with global warming is, you know, labeled a, you know, a kook. I'm assuming everybody here is on the internet or has access to it. And if you're on the uh, internet, you know, look up the petition project. And there's 33,000 scientists, myself is one of them, that have signed on to the petition. 33,000 people. Some of them are quite a bit more noted than myself, of course, that have signed on that they that they don't believe that uh, man has caused global warming. Now there are have been there have been cycles of global warming, but there's been global warming before there was man. And there's been global warming before man used fossil fuels. So, you know, what causes, uh, what's causing this? You know, we just have natural cycles that go back on, and, and measuring over, um, you know, a few year period is like, a, you know, a crackpot way of measuring. You need to be measuring over, not even a hundred years, over a thousand years is the only way you can be measuring global warming. Uh, I didn't participate in the, uh, the, uh, the seminar you had here. And there were some good things in it. You know, I saw some good things about, you know, storm sewers. You know, the storm sewers are probably half fouled here with, you know, with debris and things like that, and they need to be cleaned out. But, you know, as far as the, uh, the ocean rising three feet, I'll bring the guy to circles of care because he's a nut job. But the ocean's not rising three feet. Thank you. Public comment portion is still open for non-agenda items. There are none closed the comment portion, citizens' comment. At this time, I am going to permission from council to move agenda item six up right now. And this is a recognition of the public's manager, police department volunteer, Ted Johnson. Ted, will you please join me up here? <clears throat> Thank you. For many of you, I see some old faces here who lived in the city a very long time. Our city started with people being great volunteers. And it's been the mainstay of our city since the beginning. And I think Ted exemplifies what the city of Sally Beach is all about. The endless hours of effort that he's put into our community. Well beyond what he needed to do as a manager of public. Councilman Weimer told me tremendous effort into communities for a lifetime that you put out. And we'd like to present you with this little recognition for your efforts, and let me read it to you. This is a certificate of appreciation that's presented to Ted Johnson. We <clears throat> deep gratitude for 10 years of service to our city as public store manager, high school sport assistant, and volunteer with our police departments, stop by and say hi program. You are made weekly visits to city residents needing friendship and support. We will miss you and your many contributions to our city. Please accept our wishes for great success as you move on. And thank you very much. Thank you. You exemplified what the city was about, your tremendous effort in helping us out. It's a great community. Great. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> I know you're 
later get well with some guys who went to high school come back. But the new public city manager, they even stand up. They arrived. We went to school high school together. <laughs> Mayor, could I say something real quick? You sure can. I just wanted to thank uh, Ted and also all the public's employees. I think um, your cookies and your balloons make um, shopping with a two-year-old tolerable. And I really appreciate walking in there and seeing all of your smiling faces all the time. And I know that's the culture that Ted has set in your in your store, and I hope that continues with our new manager. And since he graduated from High Satellite High, like we all did here, um, or at least here and here. <laughs> um, we know that'll that'll continue, and I just wanted to thank you all. We really appreciate it, and I I didn't really get a chance to get to know Ted very much, but when we went to go on uh, the stop by and say hi program, and I got to see him meet with some of our older residents, that was that was nice to see, and I think that just kind of epitomizes his his participation in our city, and I just want to say thanks. Okay, thank you, uh, and I'll go right to city council comments so they can make comments. Um, sorry. I have nothing. Okay. Well, I just want to thank all of the employees and the friends of Ted that are here this evening um, to show him this honor. This room is full, and we don't generally see a full meeting unless there's something really bad going on in the city. <laughs> so, Ted, this is great. Thank you very much for all your service to our city, to the residents of Satellite Beach. Um, for all the things that you've done, even when the store was closed, how you help people, um, you know, navigate down to the other place and, um, you know, get people there. So uh, thank you for all of that, and good luck on, on your new store. We hope everything works out, and we'll probably come and visit you occasionally. Um, the only other things I have as council comments is um, I attended the Space Coast League of Cities meeting um, where we... Um, celebrated Nancy Glass, who's the outgoing executive director of uh, the Space Coast League of Cities. Uh, Nancy was with the league for more years than I can remember. Decades. Decades, yeah. And um, she did a great job for us. So they um, had a nice tribute to her, and they actually presented her with a, um, a framed um, board with every city pin from Brevard County. And um, it really was done very well. Now, today I attended the uh, Gray Robinson um, Community Leaders Forum with Courtney, and uh, Mike McNeese, the city manager of Melbourne, was the guest speaker today, and that was extremely uh, enlightening. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, just one thing, Mayor. <clears throat> I went to the uh, National Space Club, the Florida committee that they had uh, recently. Uh, one of the topics they talked about was the launch schedule coming up for this year and the importance to the community and um, one of the things they noted that last year was a, a busy season, which I'm sure we all enjoyed as we watched the skies, uh, especially at the last launch, but it only keeps getting busier. Um, they did thank a lot of the small businesses in the community that support, that uh, support the launches and stuff out there. And uh, I know as well as many people know that most of the residents around here and on the Space Coast all work out there for something or contributing to it. So it was just good to hear him talk about the communities, the community support, Patrick and the Cape and all the, the citizens that uh, put a lot of effort into our space program here. That's it. Thank you. Um, Ted, I'm going to pick on you one more time. There's one more left to pick on you. Uh, I want to, I know I've said thank you in the past for the communities for a lifetime. Uh, it lives on, it lives well. Tomorrow morning I'm going down to Fort Lauderdale to, to speak at the National Fall Prevention Conference. We're going to talk about communities for a lifetime. I'm actually going to go through some of the old data from Satellite Beach. So, again, um, you know, thank you for all you've done with, with Stop By to Say Hi with the Police Department, Fire Department, with our Rec Department. Uh, it's, it's been a big initiative, and it's uh, now really grown statewide, and the National Conference is in Fort Lauderdale, and we're going to get to talk about what we've done. So, again, thank you for all your support over the years. Appreciate it. That's all I have. I have nothing. Thank you. We'll move on to agenda item five, city manager's report. Courtney. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to remind everyone that on uh, the 25th in the DRS Center, there will be two performances by the Rhythm and Motion Competition Dancers. You can go to those performances for $6. It's like a 
kind of like a pre-performance prior to their competition, and it's there to raise funds to, for their competition. Um, so you'll see me there because I think it's very exciting to support those kids and, and uh, in their dreams. Um, I did want to clarify the muck removal article <laughs> in Brevard County, I mean in uh, Florida today. The, the inference was that the county would be actually doing um, dredging in the satellite beach canals. Um, that is actually a second phase of their project. Their first phase will be um, starting at Pineda and then they will be moving south near the city limits. They'll, try, they'll be permitting that whole area and then they'll be dredging as far as their money, that 10 million that was dedicated by the state legislator, legislature, um, as far as that money will take them. Um, and then they'll be, at, they'll be asking for an additional 20 million from the state um, to continue that dredging, which would include the satellite beach area. This year they are starting the assessment for the satellite beach canals, um, but they're not gonna be dredging those canals yet. Um, it is exciting that they're considering the satellite beach area. Um, they're considering the, our finger canals as a major contributor um, to the continuing pollution of the lagoon and they wanna see that those are dredged. They consider the, the demucking of those canals as an important factor in um, addressing the health of the Indian River Lagoon. So that, that is exciting that they're doing that. Um, I would like to present an informational um, or an, uh, a resolution supporting the, their funding request um, at your council meeting, at your next council meeting, if that's good with you all. I included in your packet um, a thank you letter from the City of Indian Harbor Beach um, City Manager who is taking the time to recognize our police department staff and officers that um, assisted on the Tempucci Drive incident. Um, we were there with our canine um, and assisted with that incident. Um, I know we got a lot of phone calls because Florida Today had a picture of our police cars <laughs> on that article. Um, and when I called to let them know that, they changed it to Indian Harbor Beach police cars. <laughs> so we, the phone call stopped, but um, we did help out with that and we got a lot of, um, we were given a lot of thanks by, by their staff. Um, we have had a notice by Brevard County of the um, Correctional Impact Fee Advisory Committee that is going to be meeting um, to decide how to spend, basically to approve a funding request from Brevard County Sheriff's Office. We don't have anyone currently sitting on that committee. Um, we would, we are um, entitled to appoint one representative to that community, I mean to that committee, and I would like to um, recommend Chief Pearson for this appointment, and so I'm requesting your approval second. for that. I have a motion by Councilman Gott, second by Councilman Brimer. Uh, discussion from Council? Hearing none because it is an action item, I will open it up for public comment. Hearing none, back to Council. Any further comment? Lenore? Councilman Altman? Yes. Councilman Watson? Yes. Councilman Blammer? Yes. Councilman Dodd? Yes. Mayor Yes. Motion passes. Courtney? Thank you. Um, also, staff is requesting your approval for dates and locations for the remaining community meetings that we'll be holding on a neighborhood basis. Um, I did pass out a revised location and um, dates. We had the original um, idea behind this was to have the meetings within the neighborhood that we were meeting with and basically trying to have it at a non-city facility, trying to keep it neutral and kind of a we're coming to you um, and to, here to listen to you type thing instead of here come to City Hall and listen to us. So what we, we had planned these to be throughout the community. In some areas I did get a, a um, a concern from a community resident that um, some of the locations were churches and um, she didn't feel that that was very secular. If that is a concern of councils, I can change one of the locations um, from the United Methodist Church on Jackson to our Schechter Center because that's still in the community even though it would still be a city facility. But the rest we can't change because I don't have an alternative facility in those areas. Um, we could look at the clubhouse for one, but it's, I mean, with just staff and council, we'll have 15 people there. And it would be impossible for people to hear in that location because it's the acoustics in that building are too difficult to hear. So um, unfortunately, unless you have some better ideas, <laughs> I can't change 
Oceanside, um, or our father's house location. Um, so I, it's really up to council on how you feel about that. Council? Well, if you look at this in the same context that um, uh, <clears throat> many churches are used as polling places, uh, it's basically just the use of a facility as a gathering place um, and um, without any religious connotation to it. So with that in mind and considering, considering it analogous to voting, uh, I would be okay with these. Okay. Okay, so here in – does council have any other – I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we have the Satellite Beach United Methodist Church on February 11th at 7 p.m., and that would be from for Jackson, the area primarily actually from Scorpion Court to uh, Roosevelt. Um, is that date and, and time for every, good for everyone? That's fine. Okay. Fine. February 26th at Oceanside um, Church, and that would be – for the area between Roosevelt and Cassia. Is everybody good with that date? Okay. The next one would be Our Father's House, uh, March 26th. I'm, I'm out of town. You're I'm out of town? This one. Okay. We can, re we can bring that one back on the 4th. How about the 24th? 24th on here. Can everybody do it on the 24th? Okay. We'll check with the church. It no, they're, they're not available. Okay. Okay. We will have to come back with an alternative date. So we'll come back on the fourth with that that date. Since that's the latest, the one that's furthest out, that's fine. We can do that. Um, how about the March 11th at the library? That meeting um, is for the area between Desoto Parkway and the South City Limits. Is that okay with everybody? I have a conflict on the 11th. I could do the 17th or the 18th. Or the 18th is a council. So. 17th, St. Patrick's Day. So you won't get people here. Okay. Or 16th. Yeah, you don't want to have it on St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> I mean, we could. With enough beer. Right. We could make everybody either really happy or really mad. <laughs> um, so what we can do on the 4th, we'll come back with some better dates for you, if that's okay, for those two days. As long as we have the two next two, we can start advertising. Okay. I move to approve February 11 and February 26. Second. A motion by Councilwoman Gott, second by Councilman Brimer, to approve the 11th and the 26th. February. Further comments from Council? At this time, because it's an action item, I'll open up for public comment. And I'm back to the council. One more. Councilman Austin? Yes. Vice Mayor Montanero? Yes. Councilman Brown? Yes. Councilman Dodd? Yes. Mayor Cotillo? Yes, motion passes. Courtney, thank you. And you'll Mayor, come back. I'm sorry, I just have two things yep. left. <laughs> um, I had two additions to add. Um, we did receive a request from a world, from a, the family member of a World War II veteran um, who has uh, passed away, and they would like us to. Um, to fly our flags at half mast, which we're not legally allowed to do. Um, so I would suggest that we maybe do a resolution or a proclamation for this um, gentleman who's a resident and um, one of our longtime community members who was um, awarded the Navy Cross. I mean, so it's pretty neat, his accomplishments, and I think it would be appropriate for council to do that. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay, so I'll notify the family and we can get that done. The next item is that we had um, came to you with the idea for um, restriping Scorpion Court. Um, we have that engineered and everything, but the problem is, is we had an issue with the City Hall breezeway is showing cracks, which we really need to repair. So we would like to do that instead and then come back at mid-year and let you know whether we can fund the Scorpion Court. That's appropriate. That's okay with everyone? Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Uh, before we move on from that, um, Courtney, would you please let uh, Mr. Ryan know that we very much appreciate his taking the time to send us that letter, and kudos to our police department. Mm -hmm. I will do that. Thank you. Any further, Courtney? That's it. Okay, thank thank you. you. Any questions from Council, City Manager? No. Moving on to Agenda Item 7, Discuss, Take Action on Infrastructure Projects. Courtney. Well, as you can tell, we've cleared the agenda for this issue. Um, it's a pretty long 
presentation we're about to give you. We're going to present the rest of the agenda items all in one long presentation and then come back and ask for your individual direction on each item. Um, it just because everything's so interrelated, you may hear something later in the agenda item that influences your first decision on a previous one. So I wanted to make sure that staff presented the whole thing to you and then we can come back and, and get your direction on individual agenda items later. This is a uh, large strategy for, for basically um, infrastructure and the financing plan for that. Go ahead. We're, this basically started, you know, when we when I came into um, the position, we we get a lot of requests for infrastructure or complaints about infrastructure. We get a lot of requests for filling in potholes. We get a lot of requests for, you know, can't you finish the sidewalk, the sidewalk <coughs> tunneling, um, you know, the sidewalks are incomplete, and so on. So we we started looking at, you know, what is our long-term resurfacing. Uh, what is our long-term plan for, um, you know, basically our roads? What is, what are we going to do about them, basically? So here's some of just the resident emails that we received recently. Um, some of them are talking about Wilson Avenue, which I live on, <laughs> so I hear about Wilson Avenue a lot. Um, and then we also have issues on Roosevelt, which you're going to hear later. And then what's my favorite one is, when do you think the city might be able to afford some asphalt? <laughs> um, so those are some of the, the, the issues that our residents bring. And our residents that we talk to about these issues, you know, really expect us to deal with it. They, the, you know, we haven't got a plan yet or we'll, we're working on it. It's starting to um, get on their nerves and they want us to address it. Alan, go back to that first one for a moment. As you can see on, the, on some of them, um, the appearance is of, of issue to some people. They think it affects their property values. Um, and then in some cases, they feel that, you know, it's, it's um, basically it's affecting their quality of life. They can't get down the street, you know, on their um, little motor thing. <laughs> um, so we need, to, we need to look at it and, and address it. Um, we've gotten to the point of, of, you know, talking about financing and funds, um, largely because we've had a decline in revenues, um, which eliminated capital funding for vehicle street resurfacing and facilities. And basically the current capital assets fund, which is what we use uh, for infrastructure, which is funded through our utility tax, um, does not generate enough revenue to conduct regular general maintenance and equipment and a vehicle replacement. And, it, and if, if we were able to do the general equipment and maintenance um, and vehicle replacement, we, still, we would not be able to conduct large infrastructure projects, which, you know, as you know, are, are rather expensive. <coughs> this is our ad valorem historically. You know, when, when the economy um, started uh, going down, property values started falling and cities were affected by that with ad valorem reductions. Um, so during this time, the city lost around $1.3 million in revenue. And historically, the city funded our street repaving program at $100,000 a year. And then when we got up to about $300,000 saved, we would go in and, and pave a bunch of roads. Um, and that kept us on a cycle and a path, um, which allowed us, you know, which basically it's just like the, when, we, when we did the vehicle replacement program last year, we recognize that if we don't start getting on a cycle of replacing vehicles, then it comes all at once um, and it hurts us financially. This is the capital assets fund historically. It brings in around 389,000 um, each year. Sometimes it, it goes up, sometimes it goes up, it goes a little down. Um, but what really happened as well that, that impacted our ability to fund streets is we acquired the Schechter Center. Now, I think everybody loves the Schechter Center, <laughs> but um, we did have a debt service payment that um, was higher than 50% of the revenue that we were bringing in, which left very little to do equipment replacement, um, road resurfacing, 
and vehicle replacement. Okay. And what I think would happen is when we did this debt service, we thought, okay, we're going to be able to, to supplement that with ad valorem, but at the same time, ad valorem started reducing so drastically. So basically, we were kind of in a catch-22 where we really didn't have any funds either in the capital assets or in ad valorem. So this is what our capital assets, asset fund pays for today. We do have a debt service there, as you can see at the bottom, and that's $118,000. That um, debt service payment is for our fire truck. Um, that fire truck was recently purchased um, last year, and that new fire truck replaced two old ones, um, and those two old ones were over 20 years old. So, it's, you know, it gets to a point where you, I mean, you kind of have to replace these things. I mean, well, you do, um, and, and that's what we did with the fire truck. So now we have a debt service payment on that. The other portion of that debt service payment is the RMS system, which we were required by statute to get. So that was for our police department. So that's the other part, portion of that debt service. Vehicle replacements um, are either at forty to eighty thousand dollars a year, depending on the year. We have fifty-two thousand dollars a year in computers and software. That's computer replacement, servers, um, you know, software replacements, and so on. We and then we mostly we have equipment replacements, air conditioning, um, and then. You know, we have to replace dance floors. We have to replace, um, resurface our tennis courts. So, you know, recreation facilities that are as extensive as ours, you know, take upkeep and, and maintenance. So as you can see, there are no roads in there. <laughs> There's no room for roads in this. Um, there are unmet needs in the capital um, assets fund or capital, yeah, capital assets fund. And that is shown in the capital improvement program. I was notified by citizens, as I always am, when we appear or a negative uh, issue appears in the, uh, raised on Hoe Cake's blog, and there's two things that were in there that were incorrect, and that is that um, we have always assured that our budget is in control, which actually it is, and this uh, <coughs> item doesn't say that it's not. Our budget is in control. We have reserves. Our revenues match our expenditures. And we're not taking money out of our reserves to cover our operating expenses, so our operating budget's just fine. But what we have never said is that our capital projects are funded. In fact, our fiscal year 1450 budget has a capital improvements plan that identifies the following project funding deficiencies, which for next year is, is at $712,000. And in fiscal year 16, 17, we're at $1.2 million in deficits for, for capital projects. So we've always had a funding issue with our capital projects, and now we're dealing with that. Last year, we dealt with our stormwater utility. This year, we're starting to deal with roads. We can't do it all in one year because <laughs> we just don't have the capacity, the staff capacity to do the major overhauls and, um, and, and engineering work and so on. So right now in this year, we're addressing street repaving. So that kind of sets the stage where we're at financially. Um, I'd like to invite our public works director up to go through our condition of our roads and our resurfacing needs with you at this time. Good evening. Good evening. I'll try to stay as close to this thing as I can. I'm going to spin this around so that I can kind of address everybody because it does involve everybody out here because they travel our roads and they live on our roads and they're going to be concerned about what we have up here. So. Um, First, uh, where we are today. Well, due to the downturn in the economy, uh, of course, our street resurfacing budget was eliminated. We uh, historically put away $100,000 a year, um, but as we needed that money it, to go to other things, um, it was moved. So consequently, we haven't paved a road that wasn't um, attached to a stormwater project or, a, or the stimulus program since 2006. Uh, Cassia was tied, you know, was repaid using um, stormwater funds uh, or was tied to the stormwater project. Um, portions of Temple, portions of uh, Kale. Um, DeSoto was uh, rebuilt. I don't know if anybody remembers DeSoto after Faye, but it was a disaster. Um, that money came from the ARA, um, ARA funds. But as far as our capital assets funds, uh, we did not uh, use any of those funds to pave roads since, like I said, 2006. 
This is the condition that some of the roads, uh, streets on the south side of the city uh, are in. Uh, these streets have not been paved since they were built in the 1970s. The asphalt is thin. If, if any of you live in that area, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, you know, we try to keep them up as, as best as possible, but as you can see, there's potholes behind the patches that we fixed that had potholes in them. This is another one of our roads, Hibiscus Drive. You can see off to the side how it, the, the asphalt is actually sagging because now the, the asphalt's so thin and there's, it's so cracked, moisture is getting into the base and the base is, is becoming compromised. If we continue to let the streets go like this, all this is going to do is spread. Here's another road, Palm Drive, as you can see. You know, one of those, one of those patches there, um, you know, it looks eh, pretty easy just to fix a pothole. But each one of those potholes, it probably represents three to four hours, three to four man hours. So if you have two guys working there, that's eight hours on a pothole um, between getting hot asphalt. Now we do more than one at a time, you know, but that, you know, you know what I'm saying, that it, it's very time consuming. And you have to travel roads like this, and you know, if you look at um, Palm Drive, the intersection of Palm Drive, and I do believe that is Sunrise, um, the water, standing water, because of the rutting, and it is only exacerbating the problem with the base. And if you can see there, the alligator cracking, and, and just another, once it rains, another pothole waiting to, waiting to pop up. This is another area in that same neighborhood in the south end of the city, um, Atlantic Drive and Magellan, um, just continues to deteriorate. Now this was Atlantic Drive and Palmetto in, in 2011. I took this off Google Earth and the last time the Google folks had visited Satellite Beach was in 2011, so this was the best I could do at ground level. You know, the aerials are a little more updated, but this is a ground level shot that I, I could get. Which, which actually worked out well because this is that same intersection today. Potholes everywhere and it, and it just continues to, to worsen. And this is representative of what we're doing now is we're just getting, you know, co trying to cover larger and larger areas because we know that we fix, as we've seen in prior pictures, you fix one area, you know that a, pot, that a pothole's going to pop up, you know, three feet from it. So take as large an area as you can and repair that so that at least you're ahead of the game a little bit. But this also here, this here represents probably um, 24 man hours of work that the one on the left there, um, it's a little larger than it looks, but, you know, Cutting, stripping, rebasing, running to get the asphalt, making sure you have enough asphalt. That represents probably two tons of asphalt uh, thrown by three guys out of the back of a dump truck. Okay, and then the potholes, of course, they're a result of the water infiltrating the cracks and then force, you know, uh, enabling the, uh, the asphalt to break away from the base. Um, Depending on the size, we've gone over the cost and, and things like that. The, the cost actually, you know, $500 um, for one of those patches, but that's just man hours. That's not the asphalt cost and the fuel cost and the machines and things like that. So these are the areas that we've identified that need immediate work. These are the worst streets in the city. And this, this is what it will cost to bring those streets up to, um, to catch up, basically. We're, you know, we're way behind the power curve, as is every city in Brevard County. Uh, we met last year, last November, with Brevard County, the cities in Brevard County, who also identified roads, um, infrastructure problems that they're having, and, and problems raising revenue to, to get out in front of these things. I don't think we'll ever get out in front of them now because we're so far behind, but at least we can catch up to where, you know, we might get close. Um, Palm Bay, one of the, one of the cities, um, is now at the point where they're not even trying to fix the roads. They're just taking the asphalt off the roads, going back to dirt roads because they can't afford to do anything else. 
They can't afford to fix potholes. They're just taking it down to, ask, to, uh, to dirt roads and trying to keep the base alive. These roads we've identified as being the next to go. Um, some, some of them, you know, are marginal. Um, there's a few there that we can see some, some definite um, potential for uh, worsening. Um, we can, you know, these, these streets can be tweaked depending on, you know, if, if there's something that we can do to, to maybe upgrade. You know, there are uh, technologies out there that maybe we can rejuvenate some of the asphalt, but th these, these are very suspect roads and it looks like they may be the next to go and we'd like to get these done in the next five years because five years with the rains that we get here sometime and especially in those neighborhoods where we have some flooding issues, Temple, uh, Sherwood, um, those areas there, um, we know that there's been a lot of water infiltration in the base. Okay, right now we, we go on to the biggie. And, and I say the biggie because since I came to work here in 1989, uh, the first words out of anybody's mouth when I tell them that I work for Public Works back then, and when I tell them now that I'm the director of Public Works, it's even more now, I can't walk through Ted's old store, you know, without somebody asking me, hey, uh, what's up with Roosevelt? When are you guys going to fix Roosevelt? Or when I meet somebody, you know, at a party or something, they find out what I do and, um, you know, where I work. That is another one of the questions. Well, you know, Roosevelt is one of the main thoroughfares between A1A and, and uh, uh, South Patrick. A lot of folks ride that road. And, and a lot of people don't know that three quarters of that road is is uh, concrete. When they originally built that road, they built it uh, with concrete, and then found out that concrete was not really the way to go, so they paved over top of it. Um, and then, you know, if you know, if you ride the road, many of the roads, uh, it's cracking, it's failing on the sides, and um, just the resurfacing of the concrete portion of the road probably not a fiscally efficient option because we know it's going to get worse. So our recommendation is to uh, rebuild the entire concrete portion to in mill and resurface the portion that is um, just um, asphalt and base. And then in doing so, we can incorporate the complete streets philosophy that was sidewalk on both side of the road and a shared bike lane um, and this is the project cost that's close to a million dollars. Here are some pictures of Roosevelt and the shape it's in. As you can see the concrete is breaking away on the sides. That's what you call longitudinal cracking. There's another example. And then an aerial from Google Earth there you can see where the, um, the expansion joints have created transverse cracking and they continue to worsen. So if you drive down Roosevelt, you feel that bump, 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 bump. There is it. Here again is uh, utility cuts and repairs and continue, as, as I can, you know, just going to um, continue to worsen and create those bump, bump, bumps. <laughs> This is the portion that is the this is the portion that's the base in um, asphalt. It has cur curving on either side, and you can see the alligator cracking, and that is prevalent throughout that that entire area. It's also rutting on on both lanes. This is the design. I know it's hard to see to um, to repair the road. I think we can. Do we have copies of that somewhere that folks can um, see? It's actually on their website. It's on the website, so if you want to take a better look at it, you can see it. But it is a complete street philosophy. Um, can you tell them what, well, let me just explain real quick on it. Complete streets, um, the city adopted a complete streets policy where if we have a collector roadway or roadway that um, has a lot of traffic for pedestrians and bicyclists and transit users, that we would basically, when we get to a reconstruction, that we will provide facilities for all of those users. So we, not, we don't just provide for automobile users, but also for bicy bicyclists, pedestrians, and transit users as well. 
Can I ask a question before we move on? No. Uh, on that street, when you do a project that complete, are we taken in because of the restraints that the state has put us on now for stormwater? Are we looking at what we have there stormwater-wise so we don't pave something that we have to dig up two years from now to meet the state requirement? I think if we're, if we're replacing what's already there and we're not adding any, any impervious surface, I think we're safe. We don't have to, and David can answer that a little bit better than I can, but I'm pretty sure that as long as we're not creating any, any more impervious surface than's already there, that we don't have to provide further to the warm water. But the piping that's down on these roads that we would do this type of project, would we set a criteria? They even say, if they're X amount of years old, the failure rate could be this. What I don't want to do is come back and have to pave them again right. in two years because we have to dig up a section of road that the stormwater pipe was 50 years old. The city is what, you know, over 50 years oh, old. Oh, absolutely. Now, and the yeah. piping that's 40 some years old. Well, in the case of Roosevelt, we're safe because um, Roosevelt, the, the drainage on Roosevelt was replaced in, I want to say, 1994. So we had all new plastic pipes put in that area. Remember, I'm sure you remember, as, as does most of the council and probably a lot of the residents, that um, the days when the courts used to flood and folks used to kayak out of the courts and things like that. So, yeah, those... Those days are gone, and thank thank the Lord they are, because let me tell you, <laughs> those were fun days. <laughs> the main run of that pipe is outside of the It's outside of the right. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. David, could you sit up at but, and the other And the other thing about the, the other streets, um, if, if there were significant um, stormwater issues there, we would look to, to fix the stormwater issues in combination with the road um, to, and then we'd, we'd pave the road following the, the upgrade of the stormwater. And I think that's it. So basically what we, where we've gotten to is, you know, with Roosevelt, it's a long time coming and now we're up at a, a pretty high price tag for a complete road reconstruction um, whereas these other smaller streets, we'd prefer not to do that because, you know, the longer you wait and, and it starts affecting the base of the road, then you're looking at a reconstruction. When you're looking at milling and resurfacing and hopefully just resurfacing, it's, it's less expensive. Um, and also, it's just as that, like the vehicle replacement. When we, were, when we originally came to you with getting back on a plan for that and we explained, you know, when you have the vehicles, in the garage all the time. It's very inefficient. It's costing us more money in maintenance than it is if we get back on a program. And this is the same issue because we're going out and filling potholes constantly. We would be in a better state if public works staff were freed to continue their park maintenance and their stormwater <coughs> maintenance. And the, you know, I get complaints about some of the landscaping and things like that. And, you know, so we would be basically refocusing our staff to a more efficient way of doing business, you know, by getting rid of some of these high maintenance issues. Um, so that's one of the, the items that we were considering while we were going through this, this presentation and preparing this agenda item for you. I do have some um, public employees that would like to take a picture and gracefully exit, hopefully, the meeting if they <laughs> wanted to, because we didn't, I know some of them didn't want to interrupt. So maybe if we could take a small break and yep. then let them do that. It's um, 5 to 8. We'll reconvene at 8. Enough for everyone. Thanks. <laughs> Good evening. We'll reconvene. Um, the down left. So. Are you? Uh, let me ask here first how we want to handle this. <clears throat> Council, to your wishes, do we want to go through all of Agenda 7 and then come back and do comments at the end? Okay. Alan? Okay. All righty. All righty. <clears throat> Well, everyone knows that um, stormwater is here to stay, and uh, we want, in, in concentrating on 
um, cleaning the, the lagoon, and stormwater is a big part of, of cleaning up the lagoon. So our obligation through the um, Basin Management Action Plan, um, or the BMAP is what it's called, um, is to reduce a number um, nutrients by a number of pounds per year. And so every, every year it gets tougher and tougher as we, we've gotten a lot of the low-hanging fruit um, the easier projects to do, the easier removal um, um, rates have been attained through some of the, the uh, easier projects. Now we're getting into the tougher projects, and so um, we're trying to find more innovative ways to, to do that. So um, we're going to go over a couple right now. Um, well, firstly, and um, this is not a scare tagged by any means, this is just fact. This is what we pulled off of the um, DEP website. And the, the TMDL and BMAP and MS4 permits must be complied with. And if you don't comply, you uh, are, um, they can fine you up to $10,000 a day, which um, comes out to about uh, $3,650,000 a year. So, you know, we, but fortunately for Satellite Beach, we had some, some fo very forward thinking folks and we got out in, in front of the power curve a long time ago. We started working on projects in the late 90s. So um, we are where we are today because of some very forward thinking, innovative folks. Um, the DeSoto Field Stormwater Project. Um, this is one of those, Innovative projects. And do we have the? Uh, here's the picture. Um, this pic. This is basically um, taking the DeSoto practice field that is down at DeSoto Park and making it part of the DeSoto drainage basin treatment train. Let me go back to the. The cost is estimated at 800,000 engineering, well, total cost with everything, $920,000. It's estimated to remove, um, or the, the, the amount of it will cost to remove the nitrogen is uh, $1,226 a pound and $4,600 a pound for um, phosphorus. And that's low because we already have the property. If we had to buy the property, those numbers would go up exponentially. Um, and there's also potential for uh, grants for cost share, uh, for cost shares, 319 and TMDL that could potentially pay for 80%, leaving us uh, with 20% of that cost to pay. And we have an annual maintenance cost of estimated $10,300. Here's um, uh, another picture of it. Basically what it does is it takes the water coming through from the DeSoto drainage basin, treats it with a material, a denitrification material, and uh, brings it in, treats it in the pond, and then it goes back out into the canal. It's much cleaner water, and it also perks um, into the aquifer, those, um, the groundwater, um, much cleaner through the denitrification material. The Lori Lane Stormwater Project is a project that we started about five years ago, four years ago. Um, we halted the project in last July because we didn't have the matching funds. We were at the 35% design and engineering phase, um, and as you can see, the cost per pound of nutrient remo removal there because it's a much smaller project and there's not a lot of room to work with, um, those, those numbers are much, much higher than the other project. And um, the potential for the 319, which we had, but we, we turned back, um, we'd have to go out again and, and request those funds again. And a TMDL grant would uh, provide 80%, which would require a $220,000 match, $220, match on our, from, our, from us. The Lori Lane drainage basin is part of the Glenwood trunk line. 
The Glenwood trunk line runs from Temple to the outfall, which is behind a ha the, one of the houses on Barcelona Court. Um, across the other side of A1A it goes through the, Delor the Lori Lane Plaza. That's why they call it the Lori Lane Basin. It's between houses in the backyards of houses on Hamlin and Glenwood. So it's very difficult to access the, the pipe. So it, it's full of roots, very difficult to access, and it doesn't flow well. Consequently, when we get some good rains, we have storm, those pictures are on here. Mm -hmm. We have issues such as this where the water backs up and I, anybody that has been around for a, any length of time traveled Thyme and Sherwood or Thyme at all between um, cat, uh, Cinnamon and the turn on Sherwood knows that to avoid that area at all costs when it's raining. And there's also um, another area that, that is affected by that. That is Hamlin and Kale area, Hamlin and Temple area. Those are big areas where that um, the trunk line takes all that water from that basin. Before you get to the nutrients, can you go back real quick? Can you, can you explain what a slip line would Oh, be? yeah. I was going to go back. I just want to show that the water. Um, slip lining is a new technology, fairly new, um, where they clean the pipe out. They take basically a sock and they pull it through the pipe and then they expand the sock and it hardens inside the pipe. The, inside the pipe wall. So you're basically putting a pipe inside a pipe. And what it does is, is basically prolongs the life of the pipe for a, a good number of years, I would say 50 years, because of the material that they use. It hardens like fiberglass. It's just hard as a rock. Uh, we used that technology on um, the Cassia Phase Two project on a pipe that runs from ocean spray behind the, the houses there and on the church property um, and um, worked great. It worked, you know, we didn't have to tear up any yards or any houses to replace the pipe. We just lined the pipe and everything just, you know, works great now. So, um, but anyway, in order to, in it, to slip line the entire pipe and not get any treatment, any stormwater treatment, it would cost $463,000. If, um, if we do the project and, and line the, the rest of it, it would be, I think, 225000 I think. I had it on one of the slides, and I don't think I included it. Sorry about that. Um, going back real quick to the DeSoto, um, the, the concept plan for the DeSoto isn't to just put a hole in the ground <laughs> it's to make a really nice looking almost lake like project with um, sidewalks surrounding um, the pond and landscaping. The landscaping we're looking at trying to find some landscaping that's compatible with stormwater treatment and then also um, looking at parking spaces for um, for that area because right now that's just kind of a dirt road you know. Um, and then we would also want to put a fountain in the middle to aerate it and keep water flow and, and so on. So those are some of the aesthetic improvements that would happen there. Um, we, are, we have a really good uh, maintenance process for our ponds and, you know, of course we would be spraying them, uh, make sure that we keep them from, um, you know, algae and cattails and things like that, make sure they look really nice and it would be a real amenity to that area, we're looking at, we would look at taking that fence down, um, you know, kind of creating a, more of a park look um, than, than anything else. Okay. Okay. Um, the, the, the Basin Management Action Plan, or the BMAP, um, required by the, the state was split into three five-year increments. 
the first five years was 15% of the total amount that we have to remove. So basically now we have 85% of the remaining to split between the, the next 10 year iteration. So in um, 2018, we will begin the, the clock on the next five years of our commitment to reduce uh, nutrient levels into the um, into the canal into the lagoon. I'm sorry. And by 2028, we should. They want what we need to do <laughs> is to reduce our loading by 10,486 pounds of nitrogen and uh, 19 or almost 2,000 pounds of uh, phosphorus. Right now we are at 117 percent of our first five years which is like I said only 15 percent of what we need to be and 161 percent of the phosphorus for the first iteration. But we still have a long way to go. And like I said initially, we've got the low-hanging fruit already, so now we have to become more and more innovative. The plan reductions for each of these, these projects, 700 for Lori Lane, it would be 81 pounds of nitrogen. For DeSoto, it would be 750 pounds of nitrogen. And the phosphorus, 12 pounds for Lori Lane and 200 pounds for DeSoto. I mean, yes, for DeSoto, which would get us at the end of the 10 year iteration, uh, we'd be at 90%, 97% of our phosphorus commitment and 71% of our nitrogen commitment. If you could go back to that slide real quick, because I just want to point something out. In the previous, you know, because we're such a small city and we're pretty much built out, a lot of our projects have been exfiltration related. And you can see the difference between the credits that we get from a project that's an exfiltration project like Lori Lane and then an open pond, which is like DeSoto, which is a large project and treats a lot more and we get a lot more credit for it. So, you know, after these projects, if we could get one more, we would pretty much be set until 2023, if I'm not mistaken. So we're looking at one, one more project that we'd have to identify in the future. But these projects would set us on a pretty good, you know, pace to come into compliance with our with our BMAT. Um, Courtney, does this pond area take care of all of the south drainage in our city, or a good portion of it? How many acres is it? It's the whole. Dis it's the entire DeSoto drainage basin, about 300 acres, and it's this location works great for um, for that for that uh, basin because all of the uh, drainage runs through that tip, the lo locale there. So um, a lot of the area is also already treated by either some other BMAP, uh, BMPs that we've been constructed over the years. Uh, but we also get correct, nothing, I would say nothing, but most of everything doesn't treat to 100% so that remaining that hasn't been treated will be further treated in the pond. So, um, and then a portion of DeSoto Basin has not been treated and will capture that area with that as well. Um, and then there's actually a small uh, portion of Indian Harbor Beach that could be treated and could give the city an opportunity to uh, do some partnering or some credit trading or selling with, uh, with your neighbors. So, um, Which they are interested a, in. As City Manager mentioned, this is a substantial project. The projects to date, to, if we tried to leverage uh, grant funding for water quality, uh, water quality grant funding to, do, to fix our conveyance problems. We know we have pipes that, are, uh, that have been deteriorated over the years. Um, so we get uh, some bang out of, out of those projects, um, but because of this, this would be a, a, the scale of this project. Is, this uh, gets you, you know, a, a good, a much further along in your VMAP process or in your uh, in your uh, pollutant load reduction goals. So. so, given the DeSoto Basin, let's use it for the conversation. This is we don't have a lot of different options here, do we? Because we don't have any other property if we're going to use this. In the stormwater water quality master plan, um, there was a number of projects looked at. Um, there's not this. There's no opportunities like this that's in that that, that we had to come up with. Uh, there's not pieces of property like this around the city that we can that we can work with. Uh, 
Um, so I'd say no. There's, this, is, this is a one-time opportunity, I think, with this, with this property. David, when we, um, when we hosted the meeting here for the BMAP, um, when Pat Altman was here and Representative Debbie Mayfield, DEP was here, St. John's, you know, and they talked about the denitrification products that are out there. You know, when we look at that 71% on nitrogen over the next 10 years, if we, and I, and I talked to Alan and Courtney about this, if we could incorporate a baffle box on Lemon Street as the trunk line, as that Glenwood trunk line comes down with denitrification material in it, does, that would up that 71 number um, substantially. I mean, would yes. we get close to where both we of, need to be? Both of those estimates for those, for those projects uh, do not include any de denitrification um, techniques. We do plan to use them. Right now, it's kind of a changing world right there um, with DEP. DEP typically won't establish uh, hard and fast uh, uh, credits for the different types of BMPs unless they're tried and true. So some of that's still just now coming out, um, but we do plan on using it. Um, Lori Lane project actually, uh, when it was originally established and, and grant funded, it did not have any of that. Um, and then uh, part of the way through that project, DEP actually came to the city and said, hey, we would like for you to include some of these denitrification techniques and we'd be willing to fund the difference. And that project actually grew. Those, uh, the 81 and 12 uh, pounds of uh, Removal there. Those are actually the those are the original removal efficiencies before we include before we uh, included that. Uh, and at that time, it was just a hey, we're going to include something. Um, we don't know how much uh, the, the technology at the time. The project got on hold, so the technology has further developed since then. So, but we do intend to use, utilize those techniques on both these projects and hopefully close that gap and probably and, and hopefully get us closer to that 10-year goal and be good for another. Good for those 10 years. Because there was, there was a gentleman there, and we were talking about the existing baffle boxes that the city installed. You know, like, like what Alan was talking about, the forward thinking people from before, we were one of the first areas around that started using the baffle boxes. And since then, we found that, you know, that, that technique has some, some issues with it. But they were telling me that, you know, denitrification products might be able to be adapted into those older baffle boxes, which would also help us in the numbers. So I would think if, if we're going to look at all this stuff, let's look to try to boost those numbers up. You know, we're doing these projects, and I know we can't do anything on the west or east side of South Patrick with it, and we probably won't be able to do anything on the Lorry Lane property itself. But if we can do something on Lemon, where we capture everything that's coming down the trunk line um, before it gets to South Patrick, then at least we've accomplished something to help our numbers here. Yeah, both of these projects we'd intend to get to look at every aspect that we could to add to it because what we what we've seen in, our, in the planning and, and what how we're going to get there is uh, some areas aren't gonna, ever going to be treated. There's just no opportunity to treat a certain area that you know let's say it's a drainage basin right before an outfall. There's just no opportunities there. But we can in essence over treat some other areas such as the, the, with these two projects. Um, get some more credits here to offset where we can't uh, do some do some other treatment in some other areas. So. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think this speaks a lot to the mayor's initial um, comment in the paving part of it. Is is you know you try to tackle two two issues at the same time, whereas this is more a quantity. The Lori Lane project is more a water quantity issue because of the, the backflow that we're having, we're having that, the, you know, that water back up in those areas. We're also fixing that problem as well as getting some treatment at the same time. It, it may be not a lot of treatment, but, you know, as I said earlier, the more innovative we get with Dominic's idea of, you know, the um, using the baffle boxes and treating the generation one baffle boxes, hopefully trying to um, modify those to use the denitrification material will get stuff that's already in the ground to work better for us. So, and I want Carrie to do this. Carrie. Um, this next item is basically what we're proposing to replace what we're taking away at the DeSoto field with the stormwater project. Um, and this project, we have actually changed the recommendation from the staff report 
um, after just you know for the community the city council members met with the with myself and the staff for hours on this before this meeting not directly before this meeting but in the the past couple weeks met with um, you individually. individually yes <laughs> um, and in those conversations there was some concerns with um, you know the lighting cost in this proposal and since there are workable lights out at this field um, there may be you know we may be including these lights in this proposal as a want rather than a need and we have other needs in the city so maybe we 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 take that and move those monies to something else so that this the, the next round of presentation <coughs> has changed that recommendation to fit your desires so um, I'll let Carrie take it over from here um, thank you um, you know, uh, green grass and recreation go together like peanut butter and jelly. Um, DeSoto is a perfect green grass area and is used currently by three of our youth sport organizations. That being soccer, the Seahawks uh, Youth Football Association, and our um, up-and-coming growing lacrosse program. The way the city historically has always worked with their youth um, athletic leagues is the city provides the facilities and the mother and father um, volunteer organization run the leagues. Soccer's volunteer organization um, has about 300 to 350 in their program almost year round. Um, football, uh, Ted is with us here today as the president. <laughs> um, they run about 350 in their program and they run uh, typically July through about November. And lacrosse is up and coming at about 100 and they run January through about May. So the DeSoto project, um, the green grass down there now, is being used 11 months out of the year with one month for downtime for maintenance um, by about 800, 700 children. So the loss of that property and without a relocation would be devastating to the football league and the lacrosse league because that's their predominant location for their practices and for lacrosse for their practices and games. So it's important to keep in mind that although the stormwater is most important, if we have a commitment to advancing our youth sports and providing the facilities that we would like to be able to provide for them in the future, we need to have a place to relocate the youth that are in this group. Um, coincidentally, at the exact same time as all this is happening, we've been walking, uh, working with um, Patrick Air Force Base in a project called the P-4. It's a public-private partnership with the Air Force Base. They are not interested any longer in maintaining their sport facilities. They have four baseball slash t-ball fields and one football field. The football field that you can see the lights from um, kind of across from Beef O'Grady's has been identified as a relocation site for um, lacrosse, football, and um, soccer. Um, soccer doesn't use the DeSoto field all that much, um, but I would hate to indicate that at any point they're never on there, so that's why I keep including them. The um, football field at the, at the Patrick Air Force Base facility um, fortunately is the uh, correct size. It does have some Bermuda grass on it. Um, we think we can capture most of that sod um, and just keep it, although we have an estimate for sod in case we are not able to. Um, Patrick is very willing to talk about um, the city's takeover or lease of that property. In turn, we would maintain it and manage its utilization. The initial field prep um, and upgrades for that field to uh, bring the field playing surface up to par and safety reasons would be about $20,000. Um, because of 700 kids and all their families uh, utilizing that field, restrooms might be a little important. That's about $80,000. May or may not need sod at $15,000. And once all that is said and done, the annual maintenance um, for our public works department would run around $18,000. That should include um, utilities, uh, light, sewer, and water. So um, we're very fortunate that the, that the interest in the DeSoto um, Stormwater Basin Project is happening at the same time as we have the opportunity to possibly capture this field. Carrie, one question on the maintenance. What's the offset? You have the soda which you're maintaining now, and you're going to be transferring that to here. Is that about what you're spending on the soda for man hours? Yeah. Okay. 
No, the, the additional cost for, for that field would be parking lot, restroom facilities, which we don't maintain at the location at DeSoto now. Um, that is, I kind of capture those costs at the tennis court in the, in the ball field. So for that practice facilities, it, that's an addition, that would be an additional cost basically. And then of course, if you add a pond, you're going to have the pond maintenance and you know, stuff like that, but it's not going to be nearly the cost that, you know, you have a restroom facility, parking lot, um, fertilizers and things like that. So, um, one other question. Does, does it fit your needs? Okay, and I don't know how great the lights are, but if they work and there's somewhat advantage, is that an advantage to you guys? Uh, yes, yeah, so it's a big advantage because, especially you know, going through this past season, um, it starts getting dark in October, and you look at you know four or five weeks, and then start building seven division teams to do eight in the evening, so it almost becomes essential at some point. Okay, thank you. Um, Alan or Kerry, either one. Parking, I mean, what, 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 you know how it is at DeSoto. I mean, it, it, you got people parking all over the place. I mean, so what are we looking at as far as parking availability? And There's much more parking at the, the Patrick facility than there is at, at DeSoto. And a good flow. And it's through. paved. Through. And if there's a good flow through, yeah, uh, I don't think that we'd have any issues with parking up there. Okay. Do you have the map still available? We can point to where the parking is. Yeah. Where's my little point? It's on the floor. The parking area is right there. <coughs> right here. Okay. And this is the playing field. And then you have your flow and inflow out this way. So, and then there's, if, there's additional parking here, but I think, you know, that's limited. And depending on where the uh, restroom facility is located, be probably right in, right in that area. Um, this would be your main parking area. What's, what's that lot to the left? This this not looks like a lot, but it's not. It's the it's the it's the play field. I don't know what happened to the lighting, or I don't know what happened there. Uh, what, 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 yeah, the oh, this, this area here. here. Yeah. This, that's just an empty lot. That's um, is that is that included in part of this or not? No. no okay. That's the former well lit. Oh. I call on both of those fields as, an, as a referee. The one to the left is well lit. The one to the right, no one would play on it and for very uh, uh, We'll get to you when you. Yeah. I know we'll get to you when we have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Um, I might also add that um, with the disposition of the fields by Patrick Air Force Base. Three of the four ball fields have um, um, high quality MESCO lighting on them. It is a bit older, um, it's at least 15 years. Um, but there's, uh, we're working now with um, the representative from MESCO to see what the possibilities are of relocating those lights to both the um, football field here at their facility, at, at their property, and also utilizing the $50,000 grant that soccer got and using those lights down at the sports field in case we don't get the second or third grant. Because I just cannot see Musco lights going in the trash. And their point is to dispose of lights, bleachers, everything on those fields. You've been told to shut them down. And that would, I mean, I'd have to go out with my truck and pick up the lights. Are the fields there by, one of, a couple of them are by the church there? Yes. And okay. Are these the fields that are near the church and on that south west side of the church on the vacant area? Um, if I could tell you where they are, I don't know where a church is in relation to that. But is if you're the, at the, Youth the Services. Chapel, the chapel. Yeah. The well, Youth Services directly east of that has a field. Right. Across the street that goes north and south beyond that field and east of that, there's three more fields there. Right. Mm -hmm. So those are where the lights would be yes, coming sir. from? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. And um, we have a representative from Patrick working on um, seeing how we can secure those lights and the bleachers there. Can you speak to the leasing arrangement? Um, I don't know a whole lot about that yet. Um, the representative that we've been talking with, the P4, his name is Larry Hornbach. He's an um, um, excellent person to um, uh, field a lot of our questions. Um, 
but he's, he's learning too as he goes. He did say that there was um, an easy lease potential with just taking over property, um, but he was not uh, real clear on all the details with regard to the length of the lease, uh, what requirements the city would have, what requirements Patrick would have of us. So um, the lease agreement is something that the um, Air Force military bases do often, according to Mr. Hornbach. Um, but the details of that might change um, with our project versus another project. And we haven't gotten that far in the lease arrangement yet. That would be brought back to you long before we um, signed anything. We have indicated that we wanted a longer term lease. Um, I think some of the easy leases that they were talking about were five years, but we indicated that if we were going to put restrooms in, we would want a longer lease than that, like a 20 or 30 year lease. So he said that he'd bring that back. We also um, provided this information to our lobbyist, who's also going to be working on um, making sure that we get a longer term on the lease agreement if we put improvements in. So hopefully we'll get that, that through. We are holding a P4 meeting um, in March. Um, that will be the um, kind of like a celebration of, you know, we, we did solidify the agreement with the youth center and our, our sector center. Um, so the recreation directors, Carrie and um, their youth program director are working together to come, you know, work together on programs for the children. Um, and that P4 initiative is the first one. So we're going to be celebrating that with Patrick Air Force Base coming up soon. So this will be the second one, hopefully. I would have a concern about um, our putting all of this money into upgrading the, the field and, and then having to pay a substantial amount of money uh, for, you know, for a lease. So, you know, I hope, I'm hoping that when we talk about a lease, we're talking about something very nominal. Free. Uh, yeah, it's free. Well, we're, we're, we're talking about the lease, it's free. A free lease? Yes. Okay. It's just a legal instrument for us to take over the, the field. Um, we also um, discussed with um, uh, Mr. Hornbach that, for example, at the Sports and Recreation Park, we have a lease there, and if the county ever decided, um, while we're still leasing it, to take that property back, they would have to pay us, this is according to the agreement, pay us for all the improvements that we put in the park. And so we told Mr. Hornbach that, and he said, oh, that would, that would be something interesting for the lease, because if, if we're able to put that into the lease with Patrick Air Force Base, then at least we would recoup the money that we put in. Right. Okay. Yeah. So now for the unfunded part. Um, do we want to do seven open up for public comment since there's the three parts to it? And then come back. I think that would be better than to try to do everything. Um, first, from council, questions concerning 7A, B, or C at this time? No. Hearing none, at this time, I'd like to open it up on public comment of any of the three portions of 7, agenda item 7. Joanne Regan, resident. Um, I wanted to uh, thank whoever came up with a great idea of putting a kayak launch in there. Um, it's pretty far away from the river thinking wise, but when you're in a kayak, there's nothing to it, and we would achieve our access to the river. So I, I love that idea. I'm very excited about it. Um, the other thing is I noticed in um, Carrie's memo um, that we would be sharing the athletic fields with the military if they choose, and I wondered how that can be structured so that it doesn't interfere with the, um, the planning of the rec department for the utilization after we put the money into it. Thank you all, and um, good job on this uh, presentation. It's really all-encompassing. Thank you very much. Um, Kurt, would you like to address the issue about joint usage? And I know we've done it in the past. Um, the reality of um, having to share the fields with Patrick Air Force Base, since it's still their field, um, right now there's nothing going on there. They don't have a lot of people on base. They don't have a lot of programs, period. So unless something dramatic happens to change their um, 
their citizen levelship and, and their program levelship, the best that they could do would be is if we were to run a program that they would be able to tell their folks to participate. I don't see them coming up with major programs to put on that field. And the lease would address that just as it does at the sports park with the county. Because the county, the lease at the sports park with the county says that we have first priority to, to do everything we need to do down there and the county can ask us for space and if there's space available, we'll share their property with them. <laughs> Thank you very much for explanation. Yeah. We're still open. Ron Dragutis, Residence, Satellite Beach. The most important part is coming up, and hopefully that will be open for comments. However, one of the most important parts. However, I do, do start to think about the pond concept on DeSoto, and I wonder if that doesn't take away the character of this city as far as children in the community being able to bicycle to uh, all those events, baseball, the soccer, the football. Football maybe not as much because they have uniforms, but nonetheless they have a place to go to. And it's a community environment where the kids can take it upon themselves to leave home to go to a sporting event and not force the issue of driving someplace. Now we're looking at another facility much further away that perhaps access is going to be an issue for some of the children in some of these events. Or safety issues will start arising for them going down South Patrick to get there. That's one of the biggest concerns that I see with that and maybe Maybe a little more visioning should be done prior to starting this and maybe a better plan can come up with where we can utilize the resources within the city and think even further out of the box. Thank you. Thank you. Floor still open? Hi, Mark Abraham, Satellite Beach. Um, question for you, does um, the Air Force pay any tax on the land? No. So there's no loss of revenue from Patrick turning that over? Okay. Uh, number two, the pond idea is kind of an interesting one on DeSoto. <clears throat> but I, something just doesn't sit right, thinking that we're going to excavate and create another swamp zone. <laughs> It just doesn't make sense that we have a river. We built a man-made canal back into the land. We're now dumping our water into the man-made canal. And now, because of regulation, we now want to dump it back into a pond that we're going to dig right next to the canal that had been dug. It, I would probably ask this. Is it possible that instead of doing the pond, that you could use the canal that's existing for the same project? And number two, is there any type of passive underground system that could be put at the end of DeSoto going into these ball fields where they have water either pumped or passively uh, driven into an underground system, keeping the ball field there and just irrigating it from underneath? And I'd be interested in knowing if there's any uh, technology that good might make question. that possible. We actually considered that. It's a very good question. If we can answer that, because I think a lot of people think that when they're looking at it. Um, we did actually discuss that to to look at um, doing an underground, if you want to address that. Yeah, the, you can't create underground ponds, basically. Um, and, and in some areas, some cities and counties have had to do that because of the lack of land. They had to use dual purpose on the land. Um, it is very costly, um, what it is, whatever you put underneath. Uh, you'll see it in a lot of commercial developments where land's a premium and they need the, the land for parking and building area and they'll put it under the parking area. Um, it is a, it is basically a structure, underground structure. 
that needs to support the weight of whatever's happening above it. Here, but just a sports field uh, would be a lighter load than a, a parking area, but it is, it is a costly venture. Um, because it's <coughs> enclosed, you get some of the infiltration take, you know, uh, taking place that you have to, that's happen, that happens with some of the infiltration pipes that we put in. Um, what you don't get is some of that natural um, treatment of the, in the pond because it's not, it's not a natural pond with things living in it, plants and fish and, and other things. So, uh, uh, so there's advantages and disadvantages, but it is a much more costly venture to, to do something underground. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and also the canal, can you address that as well? The, the, the canals, um, yeah, long ago they were, it was dry land. Somebody dug them out, and um, they're man-made. Um, now there's some waters of the state. There, there are some ownership, you know, what they call private, private canals. But uh, basically they're surface waters. Um, they're, they're waters of the state. They're a uh, water body that gives uh, fish and manatees and everything else in there. So any utilization of that would be an impact to that. Um, uh, you would have to mitigate for such. Um, um, and, and again, it would be a very ex expensive venture to try to mitigate for that. And, and, and then you have the, 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 just the, the impact of the neighbors and stuff that now they have a, um, they don't have a natural water body or semi-natural water body in their backyard. Now they have a, uh, a stormwater pond in the backyard. So, um, uh, but it's mostly environmental reasons why that wouldn't be viable. Thank you. A question. Um, at this time, the floor is still open. John? John Purvis, 135 Maple. <clears throat> One comment was made that I think is interesting, and in all our discussion, nobody's mentioned it. All our playing fields are in the south end of the city. The folks in Montecito and Pelican Coast, which is part of the city, have to travel all, all the way south to participate. This actually should be, you know, that may be a selling point for the Air Force, their folks will have a field in their backyard instead of about two miles away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Colleen Bedette, Bonnie Court, thank you for doing Roosevelt. <laughs> and thank you guys. This is like enlightening. I feel sorry for you with everybody. It's a tough job. You guys are doing a really good job. I like the plans. I'm glad that we get bicycle lanes and so thank you. Appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. Steve. Steve Headley, resident. To address the lighting issue again, I called ball on those two fields for 10, 15 years since I moved here. I also called your son played on, your son played on, the, um, the big field up at Patrick. Mm -hmm. If you get those lights off of the big field off of Patrick, those things are monsters. Even if you just get the lights, much less the standards. They are monsters. They are wonderful. And they're built to use less electricity. They are great. I would wholeheartedly endorse that. I mean, big time. The left or the right field was always the soccer field as you look at it on the map. It was always the soccer field, and people used to hate calling on it. It was dark. It was dingy. Yeah. If you get those lights, it would be monster. The other thing that you might want to consider is, God forbid, but when 9-11 occurred, access to that park shut down. You had M or SPs with M16s sitting there before you could turn off into the parking area. And it shut down for two months, and you had to. It, it, it happened after in, the, in September, so it didn't affect kids playing there because there were no sports that were, kids were doing. But if you're going to have now that lacrosse is in that area, um, in that time frame, you're going to have to try and figure out. We had to go and get literally had to go through background checks to be able to present a, a military ID to get one to a guest military ID to get onto the base to call any type of ball there. Most of the people we were calling already were military dependents, and so they had their ID. But I'm just saying that's something to consider if you're going to go, you know, satellite to there, because not all our kids are going to be 
military. It's something, God forbid, you know, but it's just something to remember or to plan ahead, even if you move that, that, that blockage past the parking lot, past the turn off to the parking lot. Thank you very much. I, I think that also goes along with why the roads are not city roads, they're private roads there. That so. would be a least consideration. Right. We'd have yeah, to we'd have to write that into it. Um, floor still open. Hearing no further comment, close public portion of seven. Um, I'd like to ask Carrie if uh, you have any comments about the distance that uh, kids would travel um, going to that uh, field on Patrick. Um, you have the most kids coming to DeSoto. Uh, most of them come by car. Yeah, I was, I don't know, I wouldn't know what that breakdown was. But you need to speak yeah. into the microphone, please. I'm sorry. Sure. I, I mean, I could get some details on addresses for you. I, I would say most, 90 to 95 percent of the kids are driven to practice. I, I'm, you know, I, maybe one or two kids a team might walk or ride a bike, but for the most part, you know. Okay. I mean. Thank you. Um, Lorraine, we did, um, if I may, um, we did ask um, Mr. King when he designs that pond to leave an area for um, just general people, sidewalks, uh, just recreational throw frisbee. Because if you go down there and if there's not organized activity there, you'll always find people walking their dogs, um, throwing a frisbee, uh, just, just enjoying green grass. So we didn't want to eliminate that capability because those are the kids and the families who come down by bike or walk. Thank you. you know, the other the other thing too that I just want to address out of my kids is they don't use South Patrick and A1A. They use the interior streets. I mean, you know, if you travel around the city like I travel around the city, they're going up Kale, they're going up Temple. They know how to get to where they're going with the least amount of uh, traffic. So, you know, I, I don't. They're very resourceful at getting to where they need to get. Mark, just a road question, David. Um, you know, I, Courtney and, and Andy and everybody have done a wonderful job putting the road issues together. Do you see of anything that they're missing in sequence or anything that they're overlooking, underlooking that is just not in this report? I mean, I, I don't find anything critical, but I just want to hear from you as the expert. Are we going on the right path with what's been proposed? Yeah, I mean, it, we, we, don't see, we don't see any particular issues with your pavement that, that, that the other cities don't particularly have. Um, it's really about keeping up with it. Um, there is uh, the various types of cracking. You know, there's there's reasons why those things are happening. Um, uh, repaving re and, and then possibly rejuvenation or, or the treatment of that pavement to get some longer life out of it all help helps that from uh, uh, makes that pavement last longer and prevents this the need of repaving later on. But no, this is a, t a typical approach. Um, you know, Roosevelt's really about the only. Odd, odd road that you have, and you get unique issues there. But uh, really, it's, it's all about keeping up with it um, and, and not letting roads get to a, a certain state where it's you're playing catch up to not only from a cost standpoint, but also from a maintenance standpoint of where you just can't keep, keep up with the uh, the pothole. And because the water's infiltrating through the cracks, gets into the base. And, um, there are some base materials out there that are more um, impervious, if you will, or, or less likely to be what they call pumped. Um, when that base gets uh, wetted, traffic goes over it, pumps that material out of those cracks, the pavement drops, and therefore you have potholes. So, again, it's, it's about keeping that pavement there. But we, we don't see anything that hasn't been uh, looked at as part of this program now. Okay. Follow up, Mr. Mayor. One more. Um, as far as time frames go, um, and I know this is kind of hard to quantify because it depends on the amount of rain we get, but I would say if we continue at the pace that we're continuing with rain and that sort of thing, in the next couple of years, if we don't do something fairly quickly, meaning like now, it's going to get pretty ugly on some of these roads. Is that is that a good time frame? Yeah, I mean, and we've seen some real unseasonable rain this year, too, yeah. this, this, this winter, too. So um, it's, it's the timing. It's, you know, when we had tropical storm bay, um, we had those uh, high water, water table situations for long periods of time with the traffic um, that did, did serious damage to the, those, some of those roadways. Um, again, it, every 
year, those those roads get further deteriorating. Um, if you're going to draw a curve on how, you know, it, it's going to be a steeper curve, if you will, of uh, trying to keep up with the uh, the maintenance on it. And the longer it waits, the more expensive it gets due to the damage underneath the existing structure. Is that right? You will have more, um, you know, just to, just to after the road starts. Uh, uh, Having a few potholes and start patching, just the just the tonnage cost of asphalt. If it's, if it's a smooth road that you were surfacing without all those potholes, you're going to use a certain amount of certain thickness of asphalt, certain tons per square yard. You start the road starts uh, having um, issues. You're just going to have more leveling cost, and you know at, at the asphalt at hundred dollars a ton, it, it goes very quickly and it can get expensive. So yes, the longer you wait, the more expensive it gets. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a couple of things, Mayor. I, I think when we looked at the ball fields on DeSoto, I think wasn't there an area, if I'm reading right, there was a proposed open grass area that we were going to leave, even though the pond was going to be there. Yeah. So there was still going to be some yeah, that's what green space plan, right. that was planned out there. Um, I also like the idea for the kayak part, since you took away the one behind the fire station from me. Um, the other part that I, I'd just like to say is, you know, looking at the B map and the credits and stuff like that. And when you look at the, the two projects that really that we're talking about, um, you know, that only helps us like eight to ten percent. So realistically, you, you not only do you need those, but you're going to need either a lot more, or as you said, another big project to really get us where we're going. So. While this is great, and I think this puts us going in the right direction, um, you cannot not do it because of where we're going. We're going to need, another, like I said, another big project or a lot of little projects to keep going in the right direction when you figure out how, what percentage rate that this actually gained us by doing that. So I, I definitely see the, the need to do that. Uh, it beats the alternatives. Um, on the ball field move, I think of talk to any coach who's ever coached around here, um, they would give up that short move for lights. Um, I know years ago when we did a study on the ball fields, did we need more or were they used to their capacity? To me, it was always a very funny question because people can use fields from 8 o'clock in the morning till 9 or 10 at night. Well, you can, but that's not when fields are used. They're used from about 4 o'clock on till 9. And if you look at our town, they're used about 100% of the time. And so moving it, because I talked with Carrie on this project from the very beginning, uh, um, Carrie and Courtney, we put a field in another part of town we don't have one. And I personally think it's an improvement if those, even if those lights don't work, you have a full-size real field. And uh, so I'm for it because I'm also for not getting fined in the end here because we only have X amount of property um, for storm water. And the health of the lagoon is important to everybody. And I don't really see, you know, I hate spending that kind of money, but the restrictions have been put on us. We have to do something. And we really don't have land to do it. And this just happens to be something that, if it works with the P4, you know, you know it's a good deal, you know. Uh, it would be a good trade for us. And I, I really think the base really wants this to work because they don't want to have to provide the recreation. And it's a good match for us on for it. Um, as for the road paving, um, I've lived here a long time. And this is something I was really into when I ran was the infrastructure. And I'm really glad that we have tackled it. I know it's not going to be inexpensive, but we have to get a road program to meet today's needs. You know, back when we started this, I remember back in the 90s, that every four year paving or three and a half kind of kept what we had up. But in that meantime that we haven't paved, right, it's been since 2006, that's a long time. And a lot of the roads were never even paved then. Some of the roads Alan told me were paved 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's built up on us and I really think we need to do as much as we can to get a plan that works financially for us too. And drive the roads. I mean, I remember the courts off Roosevelt. We were kids. It was the greatest swimming pools we ever had. It rained. They did fill up. I mean, no ifs, ands, and buts on them. They filled up. It was a shame for the people that lived there because they filled up. 
So I'm glad we're tackling this um, away from the, the ball field for a second. And I mean, it's something we have to do. I, I, I sat with Courtney a lot, and I don't really think there's any other way to handle this. We just got to bite the bullet. We've got to start paving these roads in some sequence. Well, next time we're, next presentation, we're going to talk to you about how we're going to pay for it. I'm going to make a mm -hmm. comment. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, I have been so impressed by the level of staff work in this um, presentation. Um, our staff has just done excellent work, starting with the city manager to our department heads and so forth. This is a really well thought out, coordinated approach to the problems that we have that are longstanding and very expensive and we have to start tackling them. So uh, congratulations to the staff on this. It's fabulous. We appreciate it. I'll like open it up again after this item. We're closed for public comment on that. Good. Uh, next, we want to talk about the unpopular way of how we're going to pay for it. <laughs> um, <coughs> And basically what we're recommending is, you can go to the next slide, um, to finance the immediate needs. Um, we've talked to you about roads, and we've talked to you about the stormwater projects, and we're recommending to, um, to start on those right away, largely because the longer we wait on some of these roadways, the more expensive it's going to become to bring them to standard. So um, without financing, we're just never going to be able to catch up on what we have to do now to get back on a regular cycle of repaving. We have an opportunity to replace the DeSoto field at a very low cost with the P4 initiative, so it's our recommendation to start the DeSoto project now. Even though we do have some cushioning with the credits that we have now for our TMDL, um, TMDL projects and stormwater projects take years to conceptually design, to engineer, to permit, to get grant funding for, um, and the DeSoto project's going to be no different. So we have to start that now. Um, and the other item that's critical is, you know, the minute we, we finish one stormwater project, we're going to go right into the planning of the next one. Um, so we don't want to do, you know, millions of dollars of projects all at one time, which is what we would have to do if we waited on, this, on the stormwater. It is a really good time to complete um, construction projects because right now the bidding is still low. Um, it's a good time to do roadway projects because of, of oil prices. Um, we want to do it quickly because once the demand starts, because everybody else is going to get the same idea we have, <laughs> um, the demand starts, then the prices are going to start to rise. Um, and also, it's a good time to finance projects as interest rates are low. We have very good reserves, and we're recommending a certain funding source to pledge um, for a debt surface payment, which would, you know, qualify us for a good interest rate. To do that, we're recommending to obtain the financing of $2.5 million for the following projects, which would be the first one would be the Roosevelt Avenue Complete Street Project at $900,000. The next item would be to complete $685,000 worth of milling and resurfacing throughout the city. Um, you had some initial um, immediate needs uh, on, in your um, agenda packet uh, for roads that came up to around $500,000. We're recommending to move to the next round of, there's a couple streets in the fountains um, because we're not we changed um, the direction from putting lighting out at the P4 field, the South Housing field. Um, if we could use the lighting that's out there and negotiate with the Patrick Air Force Base to move lights there, then we wouldn't have to pay for lights out there. Um, and so we would recommend moving those funds to road repaving. Then we would also recommend um, programming $500,000 for the Lori Lane and Glenwood trunk line project. $300,000 for the DeSoto Field Stormwater Project. Now, this is the match. So, Lori Lane and the, and the DeSoto Field Stormwater Projects all qualify for 319 and TMDL grants. So, we will be applying for those grants. And what we're asking for here in terms of financing is the match. Okay, so you saw a construction cost for the DeSoto Field at 900000 but the match for that would be 300000 So, that's what we would recommend financing. 
And then also the P4 recreation upgrades for the South Housing Field at 115,000. Okay. We would recommend as we move forward to, um, if you, you accept the financing idea, um, that we would continue, you know, our, our, uh, you know, future approvals to keep them broad in terms of stormwater and roadway projects, um, so that if our bid costs come in lower, we can just move to the next street. Okay. To do that, we're, rec we're recommending to increase the capital asset fund revenue. Um, we're, we're proposing to do that um, to specifically pay for debt service payment for the, the projects I just mentioned, as well as for future road resurfacing. The current revenue for the capital assets fund is $381,999. And this fund is funded by the city's utility tax, which is currently taxed as gas and electricity at 6%. Gas is a pretty small ticket item, which we receive about 14823 annually. Electricity is 367176 we're proposing to, ta to increase that tax on utilities to 10%, which is basically what's allowed by state law. This is to show the context of our city and with other communities in Brevard County in terms of utility tax. Utility taxes are allowed um, where municipalities and local governments are allowed to charge a utility tax up to 10% on water, gas, and electricity. The city, our city, currently only charges 6% for gas and electricity. We do not have a charge on water. The staff is not proposing to tax the water. Um, if you look at other cities, you'll see like Coco, who's a water provider, as well as Melbourne, who's a water provider, do not charge for water. But they do, most cities besides um, Indian Harbor Beach, all charge the 10% for electricity and gas. And to give you some um, background on what other cities are facing and you know our road situation isn't unique obviously we have you heard Brevard County um, with their blue ribbon committee trying to come up with ways to fund um, roads um, Palm Bay you know is they've tried to create an assessment for years and the voters just won't pay for it um, and they're actually turning roads into dirt roads um, and Melbourne actually their city council voted to increase their ad valorem millage rate by the full 10 percent that's allowed to pay for road resurfacing so, and, they've, and they've agreed as a council to do that every year and dedicate that, those funds specifically to dedicate, you know, to deal with their roads. So we're not alone in our problem here <laughs> with funding, uh, and we're not alone in our problem with needing to address our roads because, quite frankly, every other community was in the same boat we were in the economy with the lower property values. All cities felt a revenue plummet and, had, and basically cut all capital projects. Um, that's why you voted on a school tax, literally, because the school board was in the same position. They had five years of deferred capital projects that they needed to complete, and they have they asked you to pay for a sales tax to to basically come up with that revenue so they could clear their backlog. And that's what we're asking tonight is to clear the backlog. The increase in utility tax for gas and electricity. <laughs> Would, rec would provide a $255,939 increase to our capital assets fund, and that's kind of a low estimate, but we're trying to be conservative with that. Um, a debt obligation, and you, you see uh, in your packet, we provided kind of a scenario um, that, per that was provided by public finance management um, of what that debt obligation payments would look like and the amortization of that. It would approximately be $225,000 a year in debt service payments. And that would leave a 25939 to be added to additional capital asset fund dollars, which we currently collect. We would just appropriate another 75000 to start back $100,000 savings a year to, to keep up with the road resurfacing. Thank you. Um, first off, council comments. You know, today when we, um, Courtney and I went to the community leader meeting, uh, the forum, you know, and, and she already alluded to it, but, you know, Mike McNeese specifically <coughs> talked about the road problems that Melbourne is having. And, you know, when you look at the fact that they are going to be rolling up every year to the maximum that's allowed by the state to address the road concerns, and I think he said it was about 1.2 to $1.3 million a year 
that they're going to be seeing in revenue from that rolling up. So, I mean, you know, they have a lot more roads than we do, but it shows the significant amount of money that it takes to do these projects. You know, over the course of the next 10 years in Melbourne, you're probably realistically talking, uh, you know, probably about 15 to 20 million dollars versus, you know, worth of money that they're looking at paving, and the taxpayers are going to pay for that and add valorum taxes increases. And that's a good point. If I could also talk about that for a minute. That the ad valorem versus the utility tax was discussed for the past year <laughs> between the, our assistant finance director, or, um, our assistant city manager, and myself, but largely because um, we, you know, we knew we had this problem and we were trying to figure out how we were going to recommend to you to, to pay for that. Um, if you can see it in that graph, you see most cities already charge the 10 percent. So Melbourne had nowhere to go with the utility tax. They, you know, their funding source is, is going to be ad valorem. And in our city, what we would like to do is decrease our ad valorem tax rate, largely because that's what, like, for example, if you talk to the um, residents in Montecito, they're trying to sell that, their homes there. They want to build that out. And when you go to buy a house, you, you look at your, your tax rate. Um, I, when I went to buy my house, I didn't look at my utility tax rates. I looked at the ad valorem tax rates to see what they were, and I think most people do the same. And if you look at what other cities charge, we're pretty much in par with, you know, if we, if we raise the 10 percent, it's not like we would be out of the norm for that. Um, it would give us the opportunity that come budget time that, you know, your, your increase in property valuations, you're only paying for increased costs like health care and personnel. And then you're able to lower your millage rate because you're not paying that, you know, paying for infrastructure pro projects with ad valorem taxes. And that's one of the, that's why we were more favorable towards increasing utility tax rather than go after ad valorem. Mm -hmm. Question from Council. Uh, I have one. Yeah, and I think you may have addressed this. You know, when we talk about the debt service, and obviously it's a, it's a 15 year to get into that. Um, and we were talking about some of the streets that we were doing, uh, the immediate need for 2015, but then we also talked about the next, with 2021, mm -hmm. which realistically we're still going to be in the middle of that debt service mm -hmm. at that time. Um, how are we going to plan to pay for those, the next, the next five years worth of streets? So every year, um, we would still pro we would start programming 100,000 out of the capital assets fund in addition to the debt service payment, literally just for roads. So you would see that if you look at your um, capital improvement plan, you'll see $100,000 every year. Um, and of course, we couldn't do it last year because we don't have any room in the capital assets fund. But that's that's the want is or need is we really need to do that um, because that at, that averages out to being able to you bank up around 300. Um, and then you put it out to bid and, and, you know, complete four or five streets with that. So that, that would be the, the goal. I mean, obviously, you know, I, I don't know anybody's a big fan of raising taxes. I, I, you'd be silly if you said you were happy for it. But um, I will admit between looking at all these in the package, and I did go back and spend a lot of time looking back at the budget and looking at everything we got, I'm not sure another way – to do this. Um, I did speak with Courtney an awful lot too, talking about this. I did talk with uh, with our public works folks and stuff like that. You know, sooner or later, and I, I would have to say, we have the residents here that want roads paved. We have a mandate from the state that says we have to meet the stormwater. Um, you know, I moved to this city because we are better than a lot of other cities that we do fund our our infrastructure out and we take care of it and by all means again I, i'm not a big fan of raising taxes by any means, but you know i think this i look at it as the less of the evils i mean one way or another you have to do it um you, you people want stuff but you have to pay for stuff and again i think you're right it's not a popular subject but um I'm always welcome if somebody's got some better ideas on how to accomplish this and not have to do this. I mean, if someone's got some, some better ideas on how to do this, I'm all for hearing them. But I, I struggle with all the time I put into researching this to come up with a better idea. So 
again, I, I'm open for it. Like you said, I'm not thinking it's one that we all love to do, but I, I see this again as a necessity that we need to do that. And I think the residents are asking for it. Clearly, you know, you see the complaints. Residents are saying we want this done. Um, and, and that's what our job is to listen to the residents. Um, um, Mayor, I, real quick, I, I wanted just to say that when we went through, when we first started, I, when I first was brought into this position, Andy and I first went through the budget and started where can we cut costs, and we did. We went one after another. We cut quite a bit. We cut a. Uh, we revit our our uh, liability insurance, saved hundreds plus thousand dollars on that. Um, we do take any suggestions from community members on cutting costs and follow up on every one of them. In fact, we had one of um, our community members came in and said, you know, you could save this, you know, this if you just switch your retirees to a different plan. And we went, I don't know about that. And then we followed up on it. And sure enough, we ended up doing that and saved around $40,000. Um, so we are well open to suggestions on cutting costs, but we cannot find $2.5 million in our budget. That's the amount of money that that funds our police department in its entirety. So we have an $11 million budget, and the police department is $2.5 million. So, you know, to, to find $2.5 million out of our budget isn't going to be possible. So I just wanted to cover that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I do have a comment. I, I went and just did some figures to see really how it impacts us. So it's really a 4% impact of your monthly bill for power. I went back and got my bills, added them up, and first came up and I came up with like $9 mm -hmm. a month is what it's at it, $9. Um, and, I, and the first thing I went to Courtney was saying, okay, if you went radical on either side, and no offense to the police, but it, it, you got rid of the police department or the fire department or any of those facilities, sorry guys, and you got this county to do it. And then what I did is I went and compared cost of the, our house here to a comparable house in the county area and looked at the fees that they are charged for police and fire services and so forth. And I was kind of shocked because the difference in my tax bill would be nothing, be like $120 because you still are going to have to pay the county for those other services. You must see you. Right. And those are the only big items that I can find in our budget. And I have not had one person come to me and say, let's get rid of our, the service that we have in the city, the medical staff and the fire or the police. So how else do we generate revenue? I hope this teaches us a lesson from that. We put a plan in place and we keep the plan going because we've lived here a long time and the streets were kind of new when we first lived here and they obviously got old. And it doesn't matter, I said this to Courtney the other day, it doesn't matter about a recession. Mother Nature has no idea that recession's going on. The air conditioners still break, the roads still get driven on, and things still need to be repaired, whether the economy's good or bad. And I think we've got our, we got ourselves in a position that we're stuck with now that we have to do something for these roads. It's not fair if you live in a newer part of town that you have good roads and other people don't. We live in a community. So if somebody has a better suggestion, I know we're always looking, it's only $9, it's only this, but I don't know how to do it without doing this. And it's not that great of an impact to me financially the $9. I, mean, I hate doing it, but I think the roads are more important in our city in the drainage because we are going to have to meet this stormwater for the state and the environment, the Indian River Lagoon system is not in good shape. I just think it's to our benefit to start now. It's not going to be cheaper to do it. If we would have taken that theory 25 years ago, we'd done more roads then, but we didn't. So I think we need to unfortunately do it to make the city a better place. I mean, the infrastructure is critical. So, other comments before I open it up? Okay, at this time, open up this agenda item to public comment. Any other? Uh, public comment on agenda item eight, 
which would be the finance portion of it. And nine. And nine. And nine. It's basically increase the utility tax. Is right. Proposing. Yeah. So um, I'm taking eight right now for uh, public comments. Agenda item eight to increase utility tax. If someone has a comment on this agenda item, the floor is open. Ron Jagutis, Resident Satellite Beach. No matter how you cut it, you can call it ad valorem, you can call it a utility tax. It all adds up to more taxes. The names have been changed to protect another way of collecting the dollar. And people do look at utility taxes and the fees, the, the uh, property taxes, the ad valorem taxes. I find it interesting we talk about all the savings that have gone on in the city for ad valorem, but yet there's been no decrease in the millage rate. It's pretty much all gone. Then we look at the utility taxes. We have a sales tax now in this county, 6.5% for schools. We are now raising taxes. Others are raising taxes. And it all accumulates. This is a conundrum that the city perhaps should not be in and has used the downturn as an excuse not to do certain things such as infrastructure. And stormwater I've been hearing for years coming here. Everyone talks about low hanging fruit, low hanging fruit, low hanging fruit. Well that was the time to raise the utility tax. Nobody wanted to do it and put a reserve away. So this, Mr. Mayor, I agree is a lesson that reserves need to be put forward. Additionally, we have a 15-year float for this, this loan. I don't think it's going to be reversed. I think it's going to march forward, no matter what comments come forward. I say it should be pegged, but after the 15 years, so that the lesson is learned and everyone is responsible and doesn't go through all the add-ons all over the place, the, the frills and the everything for the pond, the sidewalks and this that may come out of it, or not time the cash flow properly, that at the end of the term of this loan, the taxes for utilities are automatically lowered back to the same level so that the future councils who are responsible for this will take a glean at this and remember that when they come back here that's not free money again. Mr. Jacuzzi here three minutes old, but I want to ask you. you a question. Okay. What's your solution? You came up here you tell us that this doesn't work. What is your solution? I, I, I didn't what, what say is, it then. No, did I'm it. asking you to help us here. What is the solution that you would do, you know, on the 4%, which, you know, is in me, I pay taxes in the city, the same as everybody else. Um, what's your, what's the solution? What's other than this can we do? First, first of all, Mr. Okay. Mayor, I'd love to answer that question. Okay. That's why I asked it for you. But I wasn't involved with anything except it bring, being presented to me Friday night when the agenda is released. All of you have stated that you all have had separate meetings with the city manager for a while. So do you honestly expect me to give you a solution tonight? Well, this is only a first 
reading. This That's is going correct. to be going on, and we're, in, we're going to be doing city meetings. And I will be glad to contribute so to that. For people, because the input's important to us, or we wouldn't go Absolutely. through this process. So what is another way to raise this that, that meets your criteria? So through the process. I will, I will pres I'll present that to you. I appreciate it. You will. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, floor is open for this agenda item. Okay, fine, citizen. Uh, I want to again uh, thank uh, city staff, everybody involved in this. What a fantastic job they've done. I think the presentations are excellent. Um, I think uh, our chairman said it costs you about nine dollars a month to accomplish this. Uh, I've lived in this city for I don't know forty some odd years, but. When I realized that that's half of my lifetime, I realized the chairman has lived here all his life. So basically, all his life he's been paying taxes to try to keep Satellite Beach the type of place that people want to move, move to. Uh, the problem that occurred because of the downturn in the economy was not an excuse. It was a reason. It happened because of the economy. It happened because a lot of people stand up here and say, I can't afford $9 a month in taxes. I don't live in any of the roads that are in need to repair right now. I don't live there. My road seems to be in fairly decent shape. Uh, I use South Patrick to drive the Soda Parkway. My point is, is that I want my neighbors my fellow citizens to enjoy the same amenity that I enjoy, which is a good road. And they don't have that. They do not have that. We can stand up here and argue with reasons and, oh my God, you know, what happened in the past, etc. The thing is we need to look to the future. And we need to do whatever needs to be done immediately to our infrastructure. Some because we have to. And this is not something that we want to do. It's something that we need to do. I'm a retired person, but I'm willing to put forth nine bucks a month so my fellow citizens can enjoy Satellite Beach. And for the people that still want to move to Satellite Beach 15 years from now, because we'll still have the best schools, the best roads, the best police department, the best fire department, and the best people sitting up there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, public comment is still open for this agenda item. Mark Abraham, Satellite Beach. The problem occurred because of mismanagement of your predecessors, unless you guys were part of the problem as it was occurring. <coughs> um, if you don't manage correctly, you'll pay the price eventually. And that's what maintenance is all about. So if there is a lesson to learn, because you know, if we don't learn from history, then we're going to repeat the mistakes. We all know that. And it's not a matter of paying $9 a month. It's a matter of stopping this wagon that's out of control that rolls down the street, always saying it's just a little bit more. It's just a little bit more. I find it interesting that if you've learned your lessons, then there shouldn't be 100000 budgeted for roads, as you stated, each and every year going into the future. There ought to be 100000 plus 5% or whatever the cost increase should be every year. So you can't, that's one of your problems. You're, you're thinking flat when the world isn't flat financially. Things go up year after year and you need to plan for it. And you really do need to say, you know, it's like a kid saying, oh, mom, I only need this. 
So you buy that for the kid. And then they say, well, I need this to go with it. I need this to go with it. And I need this to go with it. And then I've got to replace it in three years. Well, we're all adults. If we don't start running the town, understanding what our maintenance costs are going forward and replacement costs and capital goods costs, then what's going to happen is we're just going to keep sticking it on a credit card. And that's what you're doing right now, and that's why you have people upset. There are a lot of people who don't agree with raising the taxes, and we don't agree with the fact that you're not identifying the problems that occurred in the past and telling us that you understand them and that you're going to try to correct them so that they don't continue to cascade on top of us. So I'm going to answer that because this council has. We, we, we have, excuse me. We, we have, if you look at what we've done in the last two years with our capital assets and identifying the cost of repairing air conditions and police cars and so forth and roads, we have set aside dollars for it. It's one of the main uh, goals of the council was to get these costs under control and to identify what it's going to cost to keep up ball fields, ball field lights, police, streets, roads. And we identified it, and part of our problem is to catch up. This is what we have to do. And, and we knew that we hadn't paved roads since 2006. Prior to that, we had a pretty good schedule of paving roads and so forth. It wasn't the best, but we did. And now, I know when we came on council, one of the goals we had talked to Courtney about, and I know I did, was the ability to set up this asset account to pay for things that are going to need replacing, no matter what we have. And also, the one thing I know council has always asked questions, whenever we do something, we build a new building, a ball field, or anything, what is it going to cost three, five, and ten years down the road? So you know how much it's going to cost to repair it or to keep that. You know, it's an old saying in the boat business, these guys, you can buy a $5 million sports fish boat. That's the least expensive. Now you've got to keep it up and put the gas in it. So that's our city. We have to be able to keep it up and you should meet with Courtney to show her the plan, but we have addressed that. So. It's a, well, I'm just going to add to that. I mean, it's a good point. We, we, um, when we first, when I first came on board with you all, um, we did the vehicle replacement program. We went through all of that, went through all of the maintenance of the, of the facilities. And this, this is, road repaving is like literally the next stage. I mean, and like I said before, we just couldn't do it all in one year. So we're marching down the issues. And now we've gotten to this point. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to go back and question a public body 10 years prior to this because you never know what was happening during that time to make them make that decision. You know, it's hard to, to think about who they talked to on the phone, who called and, you know, yelled at them because they wanted this done or that done. You don't, you don't know what influenced their decision. Um, I can go back and say, you know, I would have done it this way or I would have done it that way. Um, but the the problem with that is is it's it's very difficult to figure out what their mindset was when they made those decisions. Um, so I think it's you know part of in my opinion part of the issue in the past is that we did have such a drastic decline in revenue. It was very difficult to program funds for that. Um, but prior to that decline in revenue, the city had no problems maintaining its infrastructure or its facilities or anything else. It was on a good track. Roads were repaved on a regular basis. Vehicles were replaced on a regular basis. The facilities were maintained on a regular basis. Um, so that's why I pinpointed that issue was because it, it's logically, you know, a decline in revenue to me because prior to that, there were no problems. No. Thank you. Uh, floor still open. Gail Abrams, citizen. Um, I would suggest if people really want to look back at the city, check out the financials and start reading them, and you'll see a lot of different things that occur there. Also, uh, I would like to mention that we do pay a tax on our cell phone, which is a one-item line that I went through today on my Verizon bill, and I came to a total of over $30 for the year of, for last year. Now $30 at this point right now fills up my car. Six months ago it didn't. Um, 
As far as your electric bill is concerned, one of the things that I discovered is it's based on usage and the amount of days in the month. So for those of us who are not real happy about this tax increase, when it comes to your, util your electric bill, maybe we should look at using less electricity and possibly utilizing solar because we are a resilient community and maybe even some wind power in order to save some money because I don't know if they're taxing solar and wind. For those of us who are, who are opposing this, I mean, we're getting taxed all over the place. And I got a 1.7 increase in my Social Security. Okay. Last year it was 1.5. And some of us had to go to Obamacare because we can't afford our health insurance plans that we currently have. So, you know, there are people out there hurting. And this does make a difference over a period of 12 months. And you need to think about that. Okay. As far as resolving this issue, it is an issue. I don't know where, where the federal government is. I mean, what happened to the shovel ready and all those other things that were promised to us? Why can't we utilize, where did they go? Why didn't we get any of that um, as far as that's concerned? Um, you know, and you need to pay attention to the economy because my question is, could what happen in 06 going forward, in 08, 08, when we had the meltdown, could that happen again in the future? And by the way, American Express announced today that they're laying off 4,000 people. So pay attention to what's going on in the economy. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, comments? Floor is still open. Okay. I'll bring it back to council. Any further council comments? We're on agenda item eight. We need a recommendation uh, or a motion on uh, direction on the utility tax. I'll make a motion to... We may have to massage this motion a little bit to, to move forward with the city manager's recommendation to increase the utility tax from 6 to 10 percent. Thank you. On gas and electricity. What? On gas and electricity. On gas. I'll amend my motion to include gas and electricity. Thank you. I have a motion by Councilman Breimer. Second. Second. By Councilman Osmer. Um, one question on this. Um, when it comes back for second reading, can we determine that date at a later point after we have our town meetings? Can you what? Come back for second reading after we have the town meetings that we have. Yeah, we have a we have a um, outline for you that if you wanted to move forward with with these items, we would ask tonight. For the next agenda item, um, we would be asking for you to approve a request for proposals for a financial advisor. Um, and then on February 4th, we would bring back the scope of engineering services for Roosevelt Avenue and DeSoto Field stormwater project. So that would start the engineering for both those projects. The, storm, the DeSoto project takes a lot of permitting. Um, and then also the Roosevelt, you know, we get so many complaints, so we want to start that really soon. Um, March 4th, we would bring back the first reading for the utility tax ordinance. We could bring that earlier, um, but we're recommending to stretch that out so that you can finish your community meetings before the second reading. So if you have, you know, uh, you know, you decide to change your mind, you can. So we want to give you that flexibility for that. Okay. Question, do we, do we need to make a motion here or just give you direction? Because since the first reading is not going to be till. March right, 4th. we just didn't yeah. want to start preparing ordinances and, you know, start the community conversations without your direction. Okay. So do we need, so we need a motion or we just need direction? We're asking for your direction tonight. No consensus. Consensus? Second. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I'll draw a poll. Okay. Um, oh, it was just a second. My yeah. second. <laughs> so consensus from council to move forward and yeah. to yes. look at some? Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Should we back up and take these items in seven, A, B, and C, because they're uh, we were asked to do things with each of them. Uh, for these, on the uh, seven A, I would move that we 
approved the report on the city's annual street repaving needs. Second. I have a motion by Councilwoman Cox, second by Councilman Montanero to accept the report on the. No, approve it. Approve, excuse me, the report on the street paving needs. Any further comment? No more? That didn't work. I got another. Has she started calling? No, she hasn't. No. Moved by Doc, second by uh, Montanero. Yes. Councilman Bonner. Yes. Councilman Osmer. Yes. Councilman Vice Mayor Montanero. Yes. Councilman Doc. Yes. Mayor Katina. Yes. Motion carries. Sorry, I caught wrong. Um, Moving on to 7B, approve the conceptual plan for the DeSoto field and the Lori Lane stormwater project. So moved. Second. I have, a, I have a motion by Councilwoman Gott, second by Vice Mayor Montanero. Further discussion? Lenore? Councilman Bonner? Yes. Councilman Osmer? Yes. Vice Mayor Montanero? Yes. Councilman Gott? Yes. Mayor Patino? Yes. Motion carries. Do we need a motion? For Provide approval? approval of the leasing South Housing Soccer Field. So moved. Oh, I have a motion by Vice Mayor Montanero. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Councilman Osmer for the discussion. Lenore? Councilman Breimer? Yes. Councilman Dodd? Yes. Councilman Osmer? Yes. Vice Mayor Montanero? Yes. Mayor Patino? Yes. Motion carried. Um, agenda item nine discuss provide direction on proposal to finance 2.5 million for infrastructure. Consensus. We've really done consensus. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, the next item is the um, we're asking for you to provide actual approval for the request for proposals for a, a financial advisory services. Um, I'm sorry. Did we deal with uh, number nine? Yes, yes we did. By consensus. By consensus. Uh, the RFP will provide, basically we'll be soliciting, soliciting proposals from qualified and experienced firms specializing in municipal advisory services for financial um, purposes. So basically, um, a financial advisor would assist us um, not only with obtaining financing, going through the RFP process, and um, helping us figure out what um, debt instrument would be the most appropriate for our city. Um, we would also be asking a financial advisor to help us with our investment strategies and other matters that we've been considering for a while. Um, so we would ask for your approval for the RFP. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilwoman God, second by Vice Mayor Montanero. Discussion from Council? At this time, open up the, for public comment on agenda item 10. If you would, would you expound a little bit on what the services are, who you're looking at? Are you looking at an investment banking firm? No. Are you talking about a local financial advisor? Um, some of them are local. Some of them may be out of state. Um, they're just firms that specialize in assisting particularly uh, municipal or government agencies um, on financial matters. So they're, they specialize in public finance issues. Okay. And are you doing this with the idea that their sale of the product is where they make their money, or is there a fee no, involved is, and you're a, purchasing a fee? No, they aren't associated with selling any products. They're just okay. financial advisors. So they don't sell loans or anything just, like that. They're just literally financial just I used to be a financial yeah. advisor. Okay. And so, yeah, we make our money on commissions. So if you don't, no, then you make it by fee. No, they would make, make a fee. money on a fee, yes. If you make it by fee. Okay. What, what fees are involved? Well, we don't know that. We haven't negotiated the contract yet. We have to solicit proposals first. So we don't, we don't know what the fee structure is. So you're saying is. you have to do an RFP before you know what their fees are? Yes. The request it's a request for proposals. for proposals. Oh, I understand that. I, yes. I understand that. Well, you don't know what they cost until you get the proposals. I understand that, except for one thing. Most people know their fees up front. The, the, yeah, the RFP is not only based on um, – there is a fee schedule for attachment A that talks about the certain fees, but it's also based on a selection committee and a scoring, uh, a scoring committee based on experience of the firm, based okay. on 
another scoring points based on the experience of similar cities to Satellite Beach, the overall impression of the firm, and whether they follow the guidelines. That's how we'll make the selection, and then we'll negotiate prices. Good. Okay. The document that you're – are you referring to a document there? Yes, sir. Okay. And I, can that, give, I can give you a copy. It's in the agenda packet, which is on our website. Okay. It's, it's the RFP itself. It so discusses what we're going to request of the firm, and then we'll negotiate a contract with them. Um, and then the price is part of the scoring, but it's not 100 percent of the scoring. Gotcha. So we're going to advertise it. We'll get out whoever wants to, whoever's a financial advisor so that, that qualifies can right. put in a bid. Open. Yes, okay. Sir. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. John? <coughs> John Fergus, 135 Maple. If anybody doubts the wisdom of doing that, you only need to go back to when the city borrowed the CRA funds and got in through some interesting financial arrangements, uh, got into a, a loan that they can't repay except at a gross loss, uh, which is kind of strange. So, uh, that was done in-house without any outside expertise, as far as I know. Thank you. Thank you. Ron Jagudis, resident of Satellite Beach. We should have an understanding, or whoever is issuing the RFP should have an understanding of the fee structure and the potential for Backloading alone, where the financial advisor does make money, backloading the loan. If nobody understands that, then it is what it is. And back when the city did get um, a loan going forward for the CRA with a wonderful swap agreement, I believe is what John. Fergus is referring to, I believe there were attorneys involved who were consultants on the whole loan. So good luck. Floor still open. Hearing no further comment. Bring you back to council. Do I have a, a motion to approve the request for proposal for financial advisor services? I think we, we already did, we did that. it. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> we got a vote on it. Right? Yep. Yeah. Captain Breyer? Yeah. Yes. Captain Osmer? Yes. Vice Mayor Montanero? Yes. Captain Willie Goss? Yes. Mayor Catino? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Down to the last agenda, item 11 is uh, proposed agenda items for February 4th. Like I've said, anybody who needs to talk to Courtney and add anything, please do. I, I have um, something. I, okay. We In March on the 18th, we have a meeting on March 18th. That's the Florida League of Cities um, legislative days are those days. Is that something that we want to look at going out? or Because I'm probably not going to be here on that day. I'm not going to be here either. <laughs> so maybe we need to look at the March 18th meeting and try and figure out what we're going to do. Well, or whether it's something that we can. Well, we my don't. recommendation, since it's January, is have Courtney look at that. Okay. See other alternatives. If there's going to be agenda items that we have to do at that meeting. We can see if we can move something out. around. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any further yes. items that need to be? We need to have the council policies and procedures on there again. Okay. Okay. Any further? Yep. Okay. Any further business before council? Um, I haven't uh, mentioned this to staff, but I was wondering if. Uh, um, February the 5th, which is a Thursday, uh, would be a good time for uh, that last workshop on the uh, handbook. Do we have some? It's fine with me. Yeah, I'm fine. I don't have anything. I'm good. Okay. Is it okay with staff? Um. 
I'm going to be out of town, but Andy can handle. Are you going to be out of town? You're going to be. Andy can. Yeah. I don't know. I mean. The 11th, you have a meeting already with the community. Right. Oh, that's CRA. 12th is not. I'm sorry. I can't hear what's being said. The 12th, I'm out of town. Yeah. I think it works the 5th for everybody. It's got to be the 5th. I don't think we have a ton to go over, do we, at that? Pardon? That's your the handbook, correct? Yeah. Okay. Does it work? Okay. Let's we'll leave it at the fifth for now, and we'll go from there. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Andy can handle that meeting. I'll be out of town. And Lenore, is that okay for for you? A lot of a lot of packets, but it's a lot of packets to prepare. That's why I was asking for a different date. Okay, then we'll do a different. It is the wishes what, of council. Whatever. What about the twelfth? Is that? I'm out of town. <laughs> Okay, then we'll just forget about the handbook. <laughs> <laughs> Let's work on the fifth for now, and I'd like to get it done. Okay. okay. The twelfth? Why can't we do the twelfth? John is out. Oh, okay. Okay. What about Tuesday the tenth? I'm good. That's fine. That works for me. Tuesday's fine with me. The works the for me. Like Lenore, it works for you? Yes. Okay. Got it. 7 o'clock on the 10th. Sounds great. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Any further? Hearing none, thank you everybody to the staff. I know this has put a lot of time and effort into it. Thank you very much. And thank you for everybody for staying and participating.